Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so the first item of business this evening is the election of a chair for the Planning Advisory Committee. Uh, do I have any nominations? Councillor Coleman? Councillor Wheat. Councillor Wheat, do you accept? Yes. Do I have any other nominations? Councillor Pierce? Move is there a seconder for that motion? Councillor Bell? All those in favor? Councillor Wheat, you may assume the chair. No objection from me. Yeah, I understand, but let him be comfortable. Uh, do I have uh, nominations for vice chair of the planning advisory committee, Councilor Miller? Uh, I'll nominate uh, Councilor Bell. Councilor Bell, do you accept? Do I have any other nominations? Is there a seconder? Councillor Pierce, all those in favor? Councillor Bell will be the vice chair of the planning advisory committee. Councillor Wheat. Uh, anyone have any additions to the agenda? Seeing none, seeking approval of the agenda with my Member Coleman, second by Member Gatward. All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Anyone with a pecuniary interest, please do so. I used to say at the appropriate time, but after the education session last week, you need to do it now. There shouldn't be tonight because it's education. Uh, seeking approval of the previous minutes. Member Pierce, seconded by Member Miller. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Education session, we have an introduction by our CAO, Michael Bradley. Michael? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. Uh, this is our, uh, our education session on, on the uh, munis municipal land use planning world. So we have three what I think are going to be very good presentations this evening. Just as a bit of a recap for our orientation program this, uh, for, the, for the new council, uh, it started, we have th basically three major orientation sessions that we have planned over the next couple months. The first one was, uh, as already referenced today, uh, it was the, uh, uh, basically the role of the municipal councilor, and that was a couple weeks ago with uh, Mr. Dean and Mr. Bell, Bell Chamber. Um, and then this is the second one, the, which is the municipal land use planning world. And then the third one will be uh, uh, municipal finance, and we will do that major orientation session at the front of the, mu the municipal budget process, which starts in about a little more than a month. So these are what we would call major orientation initiatives with, with upfront information that you will need to make decisions fairly shortly. Everything else we're going to bring forward as smaller orientation packages at the head of uh, corporate development committee meetings for the next six months. And as well, you'll be receiving orientation uh, information on, on any reports coming forward. You'll notice staff will be providing more background than we may normally provide in our staff reports on a number of topics just to provide council with, a, with, with more depth on, the, um, the, on the, the topics at hand. So, so that's our orientation program. So uh, this evening, again, is our second uh, major orientation session. So what we have planned this evening is three presentations, and it really starts the municipal uh, land use planning world really from the top down. So we're going to start with uh, Jody Zudema, who is our uh, county solicitor and corporate counsel. Uh, Jody has many years of background in the land use planning field. She, uh, she uh, 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 as well as uh, her municipal experience, she uh, was with the uh, Ontario Municipal Board for a period, and she's actually taught this course uh, at uh, the University of Western Ontario, I believe, Jody. So, so actually, her presentation this evening uh, came from from some of her past teaching experience. So, Jody will walk us through the the the. the basically the policy framework, the high-level policy framework of the municipal land use planning world. And then Mr. Trotter, Rob Trotter, who's our director of planning, uh, who has, uh, has uh, many years of experience in municipal land use planning, uh, will then be walking through us the, uh, the, the development, planning and development activities currently going on in the county. And he'll talk about uh, some of the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, development applications that are currently underway. Uh, pending, and he'll talk a little bit about the, 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 the county, where the county finds itself in the, in the planning world. So, 
Finally, uh, our general manager of development services, Mark Pomponi, also with many years in the, uh, in the municipal land use planning world, will be walking through the uh, planning advisory committee, the role of the planning advisory committee, and how municipal staff will be bringing business to you through that committee and some of the, the, the nature of the decisions you'll be making. So, so I think it's going to be a, a good orientation evening on this topic. It's a Good evening. First of all, let me just say before I start into my presentation, congratulations to all of you. It's a lovely event last night, um, so kudos to all of your, uh, your wins. Um, this presentation is very high level. It is uh, fashioned for those who have no planning background whatsoever. So I'm sort of starting from scratch. For some of you, it might be a bit repetitive. It's materials you've probably heard of before. Um, and if there are some questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt. I do have a, a moment at the end as well. Now, to get to the next slide, Adam, do I just uh, hit the this one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is how it is we have the plan, uh, the role of the provinces with respect to planning, um, what are official plans and uh, why they're important, zoning bylaws, their, their function, uh, community improvement plans, non-conforming uses, what does that mean, and uh, committee of adjustments, which I know you will be familiar with. Uh, severance and uh, subdivisions, parkland dedication, site plan control, the appeal process that's uh, now before the local planning appeal tribunal, and uh, if you have any questions. So, pursuant to the uh, British North America Act, uh, which is the act that set our constitution, the uh, municipalities are creatures of the province, and you may recall Fred Dean mentioning this in your last uh, education session. So in other words, in the Constitution, there's only two recognized levels of government. That is the federal government and the provincial government. The municipalities come from the provincial government. And so the, I always say this, the province can giveth and the province can taketh away. Um, your powers are set out under the Municipal Act. Um, there is no constitutional recognition of municipal government. So because of that and because of uh, post-World War II uh, growth, uh, there were a number of problems that arose following that, um, that activity. There was traffic congestion, strip development, inadequate services, and intermingling of incompatible land uses. All of those things were happening in the, in the 50s. It resulted in a lack of developable area for land, and something had to be done. So to deal with these, the province then passed the Planning Act, um, and it's important to keep in mind that the interests of the public take precedence over the rights of property owners. There, you'll see that uh, we have lots of freedoms entrenched in our charter. The protection of property is not included in that. So, you know, when someone comes to ask for amendments to official plan amendments or um, official plans, sorry, or uh, zoning bylaws, they're asking for changes to the rules that have already been set. And so it's really important to understand how it is that the, 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 the exception that they're seeking fits within the public interest. So um, the imposition of rights is a, bal uh, a balanced with a system of input and appeal. So what used to be the Ontario Municipal Board, now the Local Planning uh, Appeals Tribunal, or the courts as well. And the object of planning, of course, is to regulate the use and development of land in an orderly and controlled fashion. The uh, principles of planning is to control the development and redevelopment of land uh, and the uses, providing the public with um, services such as education, recreation, housing, transportation, uh, institutions like hospitals and uh, universities. Uh, coordinate services um, such as public utilities and sewers, transportation networks. And there is this notion that private development should be um, not publicly funded. So uh, there is the phrase development pays for development, it pays for itself. 
the, the principle of planning is to organize land uses, streets, buildings, parks, recreational facilities in your community, involving the community, and promoting a physical environment that promotes the economic, social, and moral welfare. This is, these are big ticket items, and um, it's, uh, this is a large, heady process that one has to keep in mind as you're making these uh, decisions that are going to be coming to you. Your stakeholders, uh, yourselves as elected officials, uh, resident groups, your municipal planning department that will provide you advice, neighboring municipalities that may be affected by decisions that are made, and then of course the development industry which includes the developers themselves, planners, lawyers, traffic engineers, ecologists, hydrologists, market analysts, and, and the list goes on because there are many experts that will weigh into this field. So the hierarchy for planning is uh, first and foremost is the legislation. And I've just cited two pieces of legislation which come up in, your, in the uh, planning field. There are others. Um, such as the Expropriations Act, Development Charges Act, those things are also there, but legislation is paramount. It, it uh, defines and binds the decisions that you have to make. You are bound by what the legislation says. There's no discretion there. The next level is case law. So these are court and local planning appeal tribunal decisions. Court decisions are binding. What a court says, you are required by law to follow that. Uh, LPAT decisions are not binding, but they're very persuasive. There's a consistency, consti I'll get the word, consistency to those decisions, and there's a rationale for that, because they're supposed to be predictable, you're supposed to be able to rely upon them in order to make your own decisions. But you can vary from them, you can change if, if need be. The court, however, not so much. The next level of, uh, of, of where you're bound as far as your decisions are concerned is the provincial policy. So there is the PPS, the provincial policy statement, and it's had a number of iterations over the years. It's, you know, started back in the 90s, um, and there are a couple of iterations in the mid-2000s. The last one was done in 2014. Um, municipal councils are required to be consistent with the policies of that provincial policy statement. Again, what it's saying to you is your um, discretion in making decisions is becoming more and more scoped. Legislation, court decisions and LPAT decisions, provincial policy. It defines the areas of where you can have your jurisdiction to make decisions. And similarly, you know, the court decisions and the LPAT decisions, they're required to follow the law as well. They're required to follow provincial policy. Those things they are required to be consistent with. Growth plan, you'll hear that term once in a while. That's a, um, a plan for the greater Golden Horseshoe. Uh, you'll hear that Brand County is identified as one of those growth areas. Again, there's a requirement for conformity. The, the term that's used in that is conformity, which means you basically have to follow what it says in the growth plan. Okay. Official plans, um, the County of Brant just underwent an official plan amendment exercise. I think there's, it's relatively new, it's updated a couple years old. Um, and there are policies there that, again, you have to, you have to conform to. The decisions for amendments to zoning bylaws and so on need to conform to the uh, official plan. The zoning bylaw for the county, there is a comprehensive zoning bylaw that uh, sets out the performance standards for various developments. Um, and I'll go into some of the types of zoning bylaws when we get to a uh, later portion in the, in the slide. And then the last area are guidelines. So you might see provincial and municipal guidelines. And I've just named a couple. One is the MDS, which is the Minimum Distance Separation Guidelines. That's the agricultural guidelines for farm-related uses, you might have heard of that, um, as well as urban design guidelines, which are typically for municipalities on how they want to see the structures in their municipality look like. Okay, so the provincial role. So planning is not just a municipal function. There are provincial interests in neighboring municipalities. Um, Often the provincial uh, body is the approval authority for certain official plans, 
or sometimes upper tier governments. Uh, local policies must reflect the government policies and the province guides that planning. So again, I've listed a bunch of uh, first the legislation, the Planning Act, the PPS is that policy statement, the growth plan. There's a couple of others that are also out there. They don't necessarily touch on the jurisdiction of this particular county because you're not in the Niagara Escarpment area, you're not in the Oak Ridges Moraine area, but there are other plans, provincial plans out there that do impact those uh, environmental features. So municipalities that have, you know, both the Niagara Escarpment and, um, and oh, Oak Ridge is somewhere that if they intermix, you need, to, you need to be consistent with and conform to all of those plans. And as well, every so often the province can identify a matter of provincial interest and that's in the legislation. So what's an official plan? It's a policy document or some people call it a blueprint of how a community should develop. It's a, it's a visioning exercise. It's a, something for a long-term horizon, usually 20 years, could be longer than that. It contains policies with respect to transit, highways, energy, agriculture, environment, commercial, residential, industrial land uses, and those are just a few. And a secondary plan, which is a term you might hear once in a while, is just a more focused official plan for a specific area. And uh, amendments to official plans come to you as council for approval. You are bound by the law and policy, the ones I've already identified, uh, otherwise there could be challenges. Zoning bylaws, they set out the specific uses for a geographical area. Um, and they can be site specific in manner, so they could be for a large area, it could be for one site. The zoning restricts the uses for which the land can be used. Um, general municipal zoning bylaws, and, and which is the larger comprehensive zoning bylaw that the county has, and then there are site specific bylaws. You might see them with specific numbers attached to them to identify them to a, a particular location. They must conform to the official plan. Uh, there are categories of specialized zoning bylaws and uh, the, again, amendments to zoning bylaws come to council for approval. You're required to be consistent with and conform to policy and law, um, otherwise there could be challenges. So to give you a couple of examples of the types of zoning bylaws, there's temporary use zoning bylaws, which just as the name suggests, permits a use to be in place for a few years. It's uh, three years. And council can grant uh, extensions if, if uh, it's warranted. T it's one thing to keep in mind, temporary use bylaws do not become non-conforming uh, legal uses at another time, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Again, in all of these, you are required to comply with the law and policy um, in implementing these types of bylaws. Holding bylaws, you might hear of that term once in a while, uh, you, you will see a bylaw with a number and then an H attached to it. You know once you see that H it means holding. And what that means is uh, there's a holding provision attached to that bylaw. Something has to happen before that H gets lifted. So it's a condition. Some, something has to be done before the H gets lifted. Um, but it's important to note that the principle of development would have already been established for that H to even be put on the zoning bylaw. So what that means is don't let yourself get fooled into thinking, okay, some of the details about this development, we can work that out later on and we'll just put an H on it right now and then we'll work out the details and then we'll lift the H later. No, the, once you've established the, the zoning bylaw, the principle of development has been established. The H is a technical feature that gets lifted at a later time once a specific condition is complied with. So it's very hard for councils to say, no, we're not gonna lift that H. Um, it, it, you put yourself in more of a precarious spot. If you have concerns or doubts about a development, don't go to the point where you actually attach an H to it prematurely. Okay. It's hard to uh, backtrack from that. Um, increased density zoning bylaws, you won't likely see that here. It happens mostly in Toronto where developers will want to build a little bit higher, a little bit uh, further out than they're entitled, a little extra density or height. And in, uh, in 
um, swapping for that, they will provide certain things to the municipalities. I just call them goodies. They could be um, uh, funding for various items. It could be something including in Section 37 development agreement. There are things that the developer might be prepared to pay for in order to have a building be a little taller than uh, would be permitted. Interim control bylaws, okay. These are very rarely used. These are used very sparingly. And the reason is because they can be passed without notice. So they are seen as being rather draconian. Uh, a precondition is that you have to have a study authorized or on the way before imposing an interim control bylaw. It can be in effect for a year. It can be extended for another year. Uh, but then you're not allowed to impose one for three years. That's your cooling off period. So because of the fact, uh, and basically what you're doing is you're freezing, so to speak, some activity in a particular area uh, uh, from any development. The whole point is council needs to be able to maybe think about something before proceeding. They need to examine it, study it. And if that's the case, you're entitled to do that. You need to have a study, uh, a resolution indicating that you've got a study ongoing. And because it's done without notice to the property owners, um, they, it can be challenged. You can still go to the uh, local appeals tribunal, but you have to do this knowing that this is a very um, uh, strict, very draconian measure. It's a, it's, a, it's a measure that you're implementing against a property owner without them knowing it in advance. So this is why it's done very, very carefully. Uh, community improvement, uh, commonly used for brownfield redevelopments and central business uh, districts. I know that the county has that for, for this downtown. Um, it's a creation of a plan for a particular area and plans are approved by the province that, that have been approved by the province might be um, uh, earmarked for funding at some point. It's a way to um, provide for additional cash, additional funding to allow uh, improvement of certain particular areas without violating the bonusing provisions under the Municipal Act. Okay, non-conforming uses. Select whatever uh, modern performance standards you want to have. Those older uses are supposed to disappear over time. So when you're thinking about extensions and expansions, you just have to keep that in the back of your mind. Committee of Adjustment. So the name comes from their role in adjusting the bylaw requirements in special circumstances. The Planning Act authorizes um, their creation by municipal council. This council has created a um, committee of adjustment through a bylaw. And uh, the whole point is it eases the workload of the council. These are things that you don't have to deal with because the committee of adjustment can decide, appeal it. Um, as could any party that has standing at that uh, committee of adjustment decision, if they have an interest, they can appeal that to the local planning appeals tribunal. Again, that committee, just like you would be, are bound by law and policy in making those decisions. The most frequent type of things that come to a committee of adjustment are minor variances. So just a, a small variance from the zoning bylaw um, and uh, severances, typically. So minor variances have to meet the four tests. This is under Section 45.1 of the Planning Act. And the four tests are set out does the variance that's being sought meet the intent and purpose, maintain the intent and purpose of the OP, maintain the intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw, is it desirable uh, for the development, is it minor? And you'll hear a lot of cases on, okay, minor, we're talking about a few inches or we're talking about a foot here and a foot there. Minor has a lot of different definitions. It's not a mathematical exercise. It's, uh, you have to look at the individual circumstances uh, for those. So it can be, mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So, uh, and as well, under 45.2 of the Planning Act, that's where the, the Committee of Adjustment can also grant extensions or expansions to non-conforming non uses. Um, and that does not have a four-part test. 
Um, and finally, I mentioned severances. You often hear of where a severance application, a little to carve off a little parcel of land, is it comes to the Committee of Adjustment. But again, those have to meet policy requirements. Yes, Mr. Pierce. Um, so just a, a question regarding the modification of the zoning ordinance. So we could have our Committee of Adjustments here, let's say Oxford has theirs, let's say Norfolk has theirs, potentially the same, I mean, let's just hypothetically say the same application went to each one of them for a minor areas. So it's up to that particular um, committee, those members of that committee, to determine their say on minor. There's nothing documented that says, you know, this is considered minor, or these are considered minor, because that's a, that, that's a huge gap. Well, it's, uh, minor is a subjective term, and there's case law on that particular term. So if somebody wanted to say, I think you should consider this as being minor, they might rely on decisions that have already been rendered either by the courts or LPAT to say, this was granted and it, they deemed it to be minor. The circumstance we have before us is very similar. So they might try and use that type of argument. But yes, you're correct. What might be minor in one, <coughs> another jurisdiction might be different than in the county of Brant because the circumstances here have to be evaluated. They may be unique to this particular county. They may be unique to the development itself. You know, you have to look at all of it. And, uh, you know, f for a lot of people, sometimes they think minor just means small. That's part of the discussion. Often minor also means what are the impacts associated with it? Is this gonna cause, even though it's small, is this gonna cause a real detrimental effect to neighbors, uh, to the requirement for additional services? You know, what are the ripple effects of this? Mm -hmm. And once you start looking at that, you might say, yeah, okay, that still is minor, that's fine. Or no, this is beyond what we'd, we would consider minor. So you have to, it's, it's the circumstances. Okay. Um, okay, and just picking up severances. That was the little parcel of land that sometimes there's an application to carve off a piece of land. So just a couple things to, to mention. You know, there was a time when farmers could get a farm retirement lot. That's gone, that's been gone for a long time. Since the mid 2000s, the PPS was changed. So now, you know, sometimes you see a of a farm lot being carved out. There are certain tests that require, are required to be met under the PPS for that. Um, it isn't like the old days, unfortunately. Some of these, some of these instances are becoming tighter and tighter to allow for, for severances. And the reason, of course, is because the province didn't want to see fragmentation of land uh, throughout. Okay, severances and subdivisions. So the Planning Act prohibits the sale of a part of a piece of land unless approval is given via either the severance, and sometimes referred to as a consent or a subdivision process. And the criteria that one has to go through to be satisfied is the same for both. That's under Section 5124 of the Planning Act. So you'll see a list of criteria. You've got to go through that same list, whether it's one severance or it's a 800 lot subdivision, the same criteria, okay? The severance process is generally simpler. It's uh, typically used, and I use this, you know, generally, usually, because it varies, but normally that, that tipping point is five. That's when I worked at the province, that was kind of the benchmark number we had. So usually something less than five lots Often developers will go through a severance process rather than a formal subdivision process. It's subdivision process is just longer and lengthier and cost a little more. Okay, parkland dedications. Where there is development, a municipality can request a parkland dedication. And the formulas are as follows. 2% for commercial or industrial, 5% for other development. And then you can also use a formula of uh, one hectare for 300 units for residential. So it depends on which one you wanna use. You could use the 5% for residential as well. You can take cash in lieu instead if you don't want them to give a parcel of land, but that cash has to stay in a special account and it's earmarked for parkland uh, 
associated with parkland. Now, the value is determined on the day before the issuance of the first permit for lands that are outside of a subdivision. So if it's already gone through a subdivision or severance phase and it's being redeveloped, then the value that you get is building permit stage. If it hasn't gone through the subdivision yet and once it gets draft approval, then the value is set at that date, which is usually less than the building permit stage. Okay. Site plan control. Okay, my understanding is the County of Brant uh, is uh, covered by site plan control bylaw. So uh, site plans are um, I another tool that's used by the planning department to require drawings or a series of drawings showing how a property is going to be developed. Um, and site plans can be like floor plans. They show what's going to be on each floor. They show elevations. They show what the what the building's going to look like from the front, from the side, from the back. Um, they're often registered on title. They they're secured through letters of credit. So that way, we make sure that the developer actually follows through with the lovely pictures that they give the municipality. Um, and it's a way to get you know get the the work done. It's typically the last stage of the development. So you've gone through your official plan amendment, you've gone through a zoning bylaw amendment, you've gone through a subdivision, and then you've got the site plans that might show the specifics of that type of development. Often when I was on the um, Ontario Municipal Board, residents really wanted to see those site plans because at the end of the day, that's a, a big concern for most people is what is this thing going to look like in the neighborhood where I live? So it's, a, it's an important piece and most sophisticated developers know this and they'll come ready with the appropriate drawings to show what, what, what this thing is going to actually uh, look like. Um, the last line you'll see, appeal process, owner can appeal to the LPAT. So this isn't, the site plan appeal is not available to everybody, okay? It is, it's restricted to the municipality and the owner. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind because sometimes residents feel a little frustrated when they can't get involved in that process. Um, however, I have seen them come to hearings, even though they're not the appellant and then they ask to be included and it's up to the board member and I've seen it go both ways where some members will say, no, you're not an appellant, you're not entitled to be here, you can sit and watch, but that's it. But some board members have said, no, I'll, I'll hear and I wanna hear their views. So it's gone both ways. Okay, so the appeal process, all of your decisions and non-decisions can be appealed. The LPAT sits in your shoes. They can make any decision you could have made. That's to allow, refuse, or amend, depending on the application. So because we've got two different systems in play, we've got an old system that's still ongoing. So there's some old files, and I call them old. They're really, they're a couple of years old, really. Um, but uh, they were filed before, uh, was it last uh, December? when the new system came in. So a lot of, there was some developers that wanted to get in under the wire. So uh, these are referred to as legacy files and uh, the county has a bunch of those. The old system at a, at a board hearing, a tribunal hearing, is very much like a courtroom where there are <coughs> witnesses, uh, lawyers, exhibits, um, sworn evidence, you know, you testify, you're cross-examined, there's submissions, lawyers give final argument. Uh, it's very court-like. And then a decision is rendered uh, by the adjudicator, and that decision can only be reviewed by the courts or by the, through an internal LPAT review system. And only a party to the appeal has the right to seek a review of that decision. So. If you're a member of the public and you're sitting and watching and then you get the decision and you think, oh, that's a terrible decision, I don't like that at all. If you weren't a party, you have no standing to be able to appeal that decision. Um, the new system, and it's just started, is um, a, a little, um, a bit of a hybrid in the sense that uh, for certain types of applications, so not everything, uh, official plan amendments, zoning bylaw amendments, and subdivisions, predominantly. 
there is a paper review of your decision and the and the tribunal will look at the materials that you had before you when you made your decision to see if when you made your decision did it conform to the provincial policy was it consistent with the provincial policy those are the same policies that I referenced earlier and um, they the board can the tribunal can ask for witnesses to come forward but usually it's a lot of affidavit material and they'll go through this paper review and if necessary if they find that your decision was not consistent you didn't you didn't make the right decision they will make a recommendation that it go back to you so think about it again okay and you can say we've thought about it we like our first decision we think we were right the first time then uh, a person could appeal that decision and we're back into the old system so it's a bit of a, a, a second thought. You get a chance to do a paper review, have it come back to you, and you get a second thought about it. But if, uh, if the decision is, no, we're going to stick with it, we, we, we believe we made the right decision, and somebody disagrees with that, they still have the right to appeal, and you're back to that, the old system again. It's a little convoluted, and then the board, the tribunal is still working out the, the kinks of this, but um, as I understand it, there are a couple of files uh, that the county has that falls into this new system. Yes, yes. Just a, a quick question on this. Um, you had spoken earlier about LPAT not being binding. Yes. Uh, LPAT decisions not being yes. binding. Could, it's could not you, binding. Could you give an example of a time either our municipality or another municipality didn't follow through uh, on that and if there were consequences for the municipality? Um, I can't think of an exact example to be okay. perfectly blunt. Uh, sure. Sorry through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, uh, I know that if, if the LPAT makes a decision, the, and I'm assuming under the old system, right. okay, and then something similar comes along and then you you make a decision that again is the same type of decision and you don't follow what the LPAT said. What will happen is if somebody appeals that second decision, they're going to rely on the earlier LPAT decision. You know, it'll be to their advantage. So it's a strategic thing. You're not, you're not bound by it. The tribunal decisions, administrative board decisions are not binding. They're, they're persuasive. And uh, it's only the court decisions that you're required to be buying, you're bound by. Okay, thank you. Okay, so what should you do to have, uh, to avoid having your decision overruled by the LPAT? So the best advice I could give you is rely on your in-house experts. They are there to help you. You've got a planning department. They're professionals. They've been doing this a really long time. They know the details of this municipality. They're there to help you. They have no vested interest in what happens. They're professionals. And so when they give you uh, advice, it's their unvarnished, unbiased, impartial advice. Um, and you've got to know that if they give you a recommendation and you decide against it, which you're absolutely within your rights to do, that um, if somebody appeals it, that planner is going to be subpoenaed by the appellant to testify at some point. You know, they're going to require an affidavit or some type of testimony, and there's got to be an explanation. So if you're going to make a decision that's at odds with the professional advice you've been given, you need to provide some details as to why it is you decided to, to go that way. Okay, so rely on your in-house experts. If you want uh, more information or need more information, ask for it. Uh, you never should feel pressure to make a decision lickety-split, because... Um, you can defer matters. I know the developers always want to get going. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of money at stake. Profits are at stake. And that's understandable. But you've got to remember, you're here to protect the public interest. That's, that's a very noble cause. It's a big cause. And you shouldn't feel pressured to uh, make a rash decision, a quick decision, because somebody's going to make a few extra thousand dollars based on your quick decision. You're there to protect the public interest. Nobody else is there to do that. That's you. As far as I'm concerned, this is an education session. Okay. Okay. 
Yeah. So right now, my understanding is we have enough stock to get us to the targets we have today, well ahead of that target. Then. Do we have the freedom to do it, freedom to defer the decisions, to, and at the same time, eventually meeting the target by the time of day? I know Rob's going to Rob's going to go into that a little bit more in detail with respect to this county and meeting those targets. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to I want to let him cover that piece. Um, but it, the, the mandate is you got to meet your targets. To make these decisions, absolutely, but accountability at the same time. So you got to provide a rationale for why you make those decisions. Um, ensure you cover your legislative and policy requirements. If you do that, you're good to go. LPAT is required by law to have regard to decisions of council and materials before council when it considered the matter. So they have, in making their decisions, they have to know what was before council, what were they thinking of, what materials did they have in front of them when they made up their minds. And they have to have regard to that. It doesn't mean that they're bound to it, whatever you decided they gotta follow. No, but they do have to consider it. So it's important for sir, if I can. More or less get the, the material that you had when you were making your decision. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so I put this nice little package came to council. Mm -hmm. We made a decision on that. Now it's going to help that. Is it possible that those people could, you know, do some more work, so to speak, so now the package is this big when it goes to help that? So it's not it's not supposed to be, okay? There was a time uh, that that's often happened. And I can tell you, I went to the Court of Appeal on what's called the complete application case because back in the 2000s, you know, municipal council would get a little thin package and, and it would just be what the regulations required. It was really slim on details. People used to come for the, your statutory public meetings, take time off work, and they would ask questions in council. Well, is this gonna affect my wells, this development? What kind of transportation? Is it gonna clog up the streets on our, you know? There's no traffic report. There's no hydrogeologist report. There's no water study. So the answer's back to the public, well, we don't know because we don't have those reports. Gets appealed to the OMB at the time. Oh, voila, all the traffic reports available and all of these other things. So I argued at the court um, that this wasn't really what the purpose of the legislation should have been, that the purpose of the legislation is that people should be able to access the information they need at their municipal level. That's where they're the most engaged. People can't take t weeks off work in order to attend an OMB hearing in order to find out whether there's gonna be a traffic expert provided. So the, the court said they agreed with that, that um, rationale. Um, the law said the developers only needed to provide X, Y, and Z, and that was it. So the court recommended that the law be changed, and it was. So now a complete application is what your official plan identifies, okay? So they are required to give you everything. Now, if they do go to the hearing and there's all of a sudden new stuff, one can bring a motion and say, hey, 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 this was not before municipal council. We need to take it back to municipal council. Let them have a chance at it. And the board has heard motions on that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jody, for your presentation. A uh, couple questions. Temporary use zoning bylaws, uh, you said time cannot exceed three years from passage. Yes. Um, don't we pass uh, garden suites for 10 years? Uh, garden suites may or may not be temporary use bylaws. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe Rob can I give you. It's a separate section in the act. It's got a separate section that deals with it's, garden suites. It's got bylaws its own. 20 years. Okay. Um, the makeup of PAC, is that in the legislation? Does it have to be council members? Do you have do you have to have members from the uh, non elected? No, it's a people? decision of council. Your PAC is an advisory committee to council. 
right? I mean, at, at, it is a committee of the whole. It's all the members of council, as I understand it. So you're reviewing and uh, analyzing and assessing applications, hearing all of the advice you get from your in-house uh, professionals. And then you're making a, really, a recommendation, so to speak, that then goes to council for, yeah. for approval. <coughs> so it's at the council level and the clerk can correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on this, that the actual decision is made. Okay. You're okay. But, but what I'm missing is the makeup of PAC. Yes. Can it be non-elected people? Like, does, it, does the Planning Act speak to the makeup of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. I've never a been asked that question. I, I, don't, I don't recall anything in the Planning Act that, that's been, yeah, I don't. I can speak to okay. That. Do a tag team here. <laughs> the uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, there was a recent change to the Planning Act that required a, um, a member of the public to sit on the Planning Advisory Committee. But it's, I think, I think I sent an email around, around to folks on this matter. But it, it's it's a different committee. This group is called the Planning Advisory Committee, as it's established by the County of Brant. That's requiring um, a different group which was required to have members of the public. This council had delegated that to our Agricultural Advisory Committee, <coughs> pardon okay. me, which already has members of the public on it. The, the difficulty with that, that whole process is the province established that legislation but gave no parameters as to what they were supposed to do. So it was a lot of municipalities were really wrestling with what their, this new planning advisory committee is supposed to do. So we've, we've established some criteria for our planning advisory committee, not this group, but the agricultural one. Um, to, to work on some policy matters that relate to agricultural matters, for instance. That type of thing has been already established. So that, I don't know if that answers your question. Might a little bit, but uh, we can have clear as mud for now. Okay, we'll go on. I appreciate sure. that, Rob. Um, another question, Jody. Uh, committee of Adjustment. Um, the, uh, well, when we have a planning matter before planning, um, we have to give notice mm -hmm. um, X number of meters from the subject property. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that the same as um, Committee of Adjustment uh, hearings? It depends on the application, and it's in the regulations uh, with respect <laughs> to notice. Do you want the specifics? Not, not at the moment. It depends on the application. Okay. And then uh, one other question. Oh, actually two more. <laughs> um, site, uh, site alteration bylaw, how does that fit into this overall? Now, the site alteration bylaw is a municipal bylaw. It's not a Planning Act bylaw? It doesn't fall under the Planning Act at all, but it's, it's, um, it's looked after, I guess, by our planning department, per se. But there's no... Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and then yeah. you, you said, and I wrote this down, I quote you, we're there to protect the public interest. Yes. I guess this... <laughs> I'd almost like to sit down and have a, a, an hour-long talk just about this, because... Anytime we've gone against um, planning's recommendation, it's it's usually a lot of people from the public here, you know, speaking against whatever. And, and, and yep, you know, it it goes, it meshes with our official plan. Um, it meshes with provincial policies. But boy, the people around there, they just don't want it. And you know, for whatever reason, crime, traffic, you name it. Um, how, how do you, how do you, how do you mesh those two together, saying, well, we're there to protect the public interest. Staff has said, no, it's okay. They can, they can go ahead and do well, it. You know? if, if, if I can interrupt for a second. Remember, the public is not just the public that's present in the room. Mm -hmm. It's a broader public interest. It's all the people out there that, that are still in their homes. Um, because at the end of the day, the amendment that someone is seeking is an exception to the rules. The rules, the policies that are set out in your official plan, in your zoning bylaw, these have been formulated with the notion of uh, some type of strategic vision. Okay, we want, it's, and again, it's not for me to say, this is for you to determine, your municipality to look a certain way, to, to, to be in a certain position in 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Even beyond, I've seen strategic planning go to 75 years when it thinks when you're thinking about infrastructure because putting pipes into a, into the ground that's very expensive and you know that development's going to follow wherever those pipes go. 
So that visioning exercise is encapsulated in the policies of your official plan. <coughs> you, those policies are speaking to the public interest. So this is why when your planning department gives you advice and says this conforms to the policies, they're talking about the public interest. The individuals who come to talk to you on a one-on-one, -on -one, the ones who come into this council chamber, they're talking about their individual interests, okay? How this affects me and my backyard and what I get to look at. And that's fair, that's okay, but it's one piece of the public interest. Yours is a much larger vision. Thank and you're right, it probably would take a lot longer to discuss yeah. it and maybe a few bottles of wine. <laughs> Fair enough, thank you. Yes, Mr. Lafriere. Okay. Um, Jody, you were mentioning that LPAT um, look at all the material when they're considering an appeal for a plan of subdivision, as an example. And they also want to know what was before council. Mm -hmm. We don't always see all the reports. We get, maybe I should call them executive summaries. I brought this up last fall because I was at a conference, the AMO conference, and I was at a session on LPAT, mm -hmm. and they they said that, that you have to, council has to see all the material. And I brought that forward and then at one meeting um, or the next meeting, um, General Manager Pomponi brought a file like this for that particular subdivision, this high. So how do we balance, like, our, are we actually expected to get all that material or is an executive summary of the traffic report and the noise report and all the other reports acceptable? And, and maybe the engineered grading plans, because we're not engineers, uh, most of us. We don't know how to read all the numbers on a grading plan. We rely on our staff to advise us. So how do you balance that out? Uh, well, you've made a very fair point, uh, and, and you're right. Generally speaking, there isn't any one person who sits in, in council or the decision maker at LPAT who knows it all to be able to look at that kind of detail and you rely on the advice of your professionals. They ferret through the materials um, and you know, you get a transportation report and it'll have turning radiuses and how many cars are in whatever intersection. That may have be of meaning to you, but it may not. Um, so I think you're, it's absolutely acceptable to have your executive summaries and the materials that you get which are reflective of those detailed reports. Um, I think if you want to see those additional reports, then you certainly have the right to ask for them if you want to see them. I don't think they're necessary. Okay, I don't know if that answers your question. Mark. Thank you. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, kind of a, a 1A, 1B question. Uh, the, the slide on parkland dedication, and, mm -hmm. and uh, as David said, thank you so much for this. I'm trying to Thank you so much for this uh, educational piece, but the, the, the piece on parkland dedication, Yes. are there stats on the county's history um, with that in terms of, or report where they've requested cash in lieu versus where they've done the, the, oh. the, the parkland dedication? And then part two of that question. Okay, on that one, yep. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. great. So I'll, I'll touch base with how to get those. Uh, the other part of that, that that maybe is more relevant for your set is, is there a similar policy around educational lands and the provision of lands for schools and things like that? Um, okay, so I know that in uh, most subdivision plans, there is a, a conversation with the local school board to determine how many, how many students are going to be, um, you know, in the particular residential subdivision and whether that necessitates a school site. So, pardon me, the developers tend to identify that upfront in their subdivision stage. 
And, and are the developers then, like the parkland dedication, are they somewhat responsible for the maintenance of that land for that space? Well, the, the, on the plan, and again, Rob could maybe talk about this more in detail because this is more of a detailed issue. Sure. I've seen subdivision plans that have the school site identified as part of the plan, and that's through the negotiations with the local school board. Sometimes there's uh, the Catholic as well as uh, a public school site that's identified. And, and there may be parkland associated with that. They often try and integrate all of it. And, and is there a cash in lieu option there as well? For Not that I know of. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to go backwards. Okay. To the application. We have been criticized in the past for, let's put it this way, lack of public notice. The little red little flags in the corner of a lot and the little square, you know, mm. and this is, this is what they're asking for a severance, they're asking for a, a variance of some sort like this, and the mm. public doesn't seem to know what's going on. And I know we are following the guidelines, but has there any been ever been suggested about better giving notice to the public? Do we have to put it, um, I think the municipality to the east of us still puts it in the spectator? The Do requirements for notice, again, are in the regulations. Yes. Okay. And they've been around for a while. Um, the one regulation on uh, minor variances has been around since 96. The ones on the official plan amendments and zoning and subdivisions have been around since 2006. So they're 20, over 20 years old and 10-ish years old. To put it in the paper, you know, and where the signs to be located and so on. And then, of course, notice has got to go to individual entities as well, like Canada Post and Bell Canada and so on, okay? Um, so that's the requirement. And I know that staff are working on trying to implement um, notice that will be a little more user friendly, if I can use that term. We're in the process of that. I've, I've given some advice on that and I know that there is some dialogue uh, to address that very issue. Well, typically, it's, uh, it used to be every five years. I know the county just underwent their official plan review. Uh, Councillor's asking how, how often it has to be reviewed, the official plan, and I know that the county just underwent it not that long ago. In 2012. 2012. It's a comprehensive review. Yeah, uh, the, uh, I believe the official plan was adopted in 2000, or 2000, I think it was like 2010, and then it, it was approved by the province in 2012, so it, it kind of, it's, it's been in place since 2012. So there's no point from that to really yes. take the part of the document? Yes. Yeah. Which is what? 2022. You're welcome. <coughs> Thanks. Okay. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone, and congratulations to those who were elected to their various positions. Welcome aboard. Um, uh, thank you, 
thank you to Jody for that uh, um, planning or uh, planning 101. I learned a lot there actually, which should worry most of you. But <laughs> um, so this is a, this is a little more scoped down in terms of uh, what's happening in the in the county. I'm going to focus on kind of the major major growth areas. Um, if you have any questions about some of the smaller projects, we can we can get into it, but. Uh, feel free to, um, after the presentation's over, uh, if, if you need to come and speak with me or, or any of my staff regarding a particular application that might be of interest to you, feel free to do that. We, we, we just don't have enough time tonight to get into the details of every single one. So we'll get going. Um, uh, growth has arrived in Brant. Um, how much? We, we anticipate roughly, I've got roughly there, 20,000 people in the next seven to 10 years. That will, of course, be dependent on market uptake, how quickly people uh, acquire, acquire homes, how quickly we are able to put in infrastructure. That's a pretty big jump over our current population. That's, that's, it's, quite a, it's quite a change for, a, um, for a, what was a, predominantly a, a rural, uh, rural count, county with a small town, if you will. Why? Why are we growing so much? Um, Jody spoke about it a little bit. A little bit. We're mandated to by the province of Ontario under the 2017 Places to Grow Growth Plan. Um, the the whole Golden Horseshoe area, as it's often referred to, 12 million people by 20, 2031, and up to 13 and a half by 2041. That's that's a lot of people in a very very small concentrated area. And we're anticipated, as, as uh, Councillor Bell said, those targets for us are 57,000 people by the year 2041. That's a lot of people. Um, I was at a recent um, uh, workshop at, in, in Toronto talking about growth plan and changes, potential changes to the growth plan that might be coming through. And the province, uh, the province did say that there are no growth plan police out there. They're not, they don't come, down, come around with their, with their guns out trying, trying to keep keeping tabs on us. Um, so your comment about can we phase that? Yeah, we can phase that, and um, we have lots of we have lots of uh, ability to do that. And I'll touch on that a little bit. This is the um, the uh, the plan uh, that's attached to the to the uh, uh, Golden Horseshoe Growth Plan. Um, the quote there just talks about the, um, the the magnitude of the growth in that Golden Horseshoe area. Um, the the piece that the reason why I included this this plan here is because you can see the the green belt that people often talk about is not, not surprisingly on the sketch this this green belt that wraps around the whole GTA area and you can see that we are just just to the west of it there and so that the the discussion of you know the people leaping over the green belt uh, once the once the the uh, the, uh, the, the developable growth areas inside the green belt are all uh, all built out. We are the landing pad for those people that want to leap over it, and so that's that's why there's so much growth coming here. A lot of the the areas that are within the GTA area are building up, building out, and they are looking for new areas uh, for potential growth. Um, you can see some very very small purple purple dots. Paris is right there. St. George is up here. Burford is a small dot over there. Some of the smaller communities within the county are identified within the growth plan. None of them are identified as, as urban growth centers. You see here a, 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 yellow, an, a yellow dot identified as an urban growth center. Um, Brantford, the city, is, is identified as an urban growth center, but nothing in the county is. And I, I think the biggest um, reason for that is that we don't have the transit, uh, the type of transit um, that the larger centers have. Um, the growth plan applies to the entire growth area. You can imagine the difference between something in down, downtown Toronto and something w way, way up here or, or, or way out here in, in Durham. I mean, it's, it's completely different. They're completely different. And yet we're all painted with the same brush. So that's why the province has allowed uh, municipal councils to establish their own levels of um, levels of growth to some degree and council has done that um, here in the county and i'm sure we will continue to do that but i wanted to show that because it kind of gives a pretty good graphic of where the green belt is in in in, re in relation to the county and just we're, we're the landing pad when people want to leap the green belt um, the uh, why why are we growing so much or why are we anticipated to grow so much um, that that greater horse golden horseshoe that I just had up on the sketch 25% of Canada's gross Canada's gross domestic product comes out of that area so it's got 
within the within the green belt and the areas around it, we've got significant um, ecological, hydrological uh, features. Uh, there are multiple growth plans. Jody uh, named some of them there. And we need to, to balance this population growth against all these other features. So you've got environmental areas, you've got ecological areas, and yet we're, we're still intended or we're still expected to grow. And so the result of this is um, a more compact and more urban form of development. So you're starting to see the, the, the natural heritage or open space features are taken out of those or untouched within those plans. So the actual amount of developable area within a plan of subdivision gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So you have to get more and more intense uh, growth within those, those areas. At the same time, we have to try and build com complete communities. And we'll, we'll talk about, I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. <coughs> I apologize, I have nursing a cold here, so it's, I apologize. Um, I just put this quote in um, in our, our most recent issue of the Ontario Planning Journal. This is this is what we've been dealing with ever since I came to the county. It's been just a little over five years now. In a high growth scenario, planners will spend a large portion of their time responding to the physical physical aspects of development, processing applications, managing growth, allocating uh, allocating land uses, planning for transportation infrastructure. When I read that, I thought, I thought wow, that's that's been my life for the past five years. That's what we've been doing here, and. Um, I'm not surprised when, when, you, when you, see the, you get to see the amount of growth that's happening here. I just titled this slide, slide, uh, this slide Time. Um, development takes a long time. Um, a lot of the stuff that this council and the previous council was dealing with is a result of planning approvals that were given 10, 15 years ago. It's, and and you get, oftentimes you'll, you'll see a lot of people within the council chamber opposing things that were approved decades ago. The Paris Grand Golf Course, that was in the 2000 official plan. It's a long time ago. And now we're, now we're seeing it get developed. Um, and, and kind of, well, what, why? Why now? Why, why so much now? And that's at the, the very bottom of the slide there. I've got, you've got this, this perfect alignment of all these planets that are lining up. Our infrastructure is, is there for the most part. We've got some th pieces that we're still adding, we're, we still need. Brantford has run out of developable land, even though we, we, we did the boundary adjustment. It's going to take them quite some time to bring those land, to, get to make those lands available for development. There's a lot of studies, a lot of infrastructure that they have to do. Interest rates are still relatively good in terms of uh, people acquiring homes. And like I said, developers are jumping the green belt. They're, come, they're landing here. So when you start to line all these things up, Brant County becomes the hotbed for where growth is happening. Interesting, interestingly, if you think back to the, to the map I had up of the green belt, or rather of the growth plan, Norfolk, not in the growth plan. Oxford, not in the growth plan. <laughs> we're in the growth plan. So it's, we're right on the western edge of the growth plan. So the other municipalities around us, they're, it's kind of apples and oranges in terms of what what's, could happen here and what can happen there. I don't mind, Mr. Chairman, if well, I don't mind. If you want to change, go ahead. No, that's, I, I don't mind. Joan, uh, Councillor oh, Gatward. You just said about Bramford not being able to develop <coughs> the land that we have. Um, Through the boundary adjustment? Yeah. You have given them, yeah. I guess, um, in a way, that could be a good thing for Brant County because of the fact that our developers and our local builders will be able to sell their subdivision homes because there's all kinds of it, as we all know, going on right now. Mm -hmm. And since the city can't build, it, our build-outs will happen faster. A fair statement? I think that's to some degree a fair statement. I think um, in terms of mm -hmm. opportunity, I think there's an opportunity for the county to um, maybe um, acquire some of that growth that might have gone to Brantford or will go to Brantford in the future. I think that window of opportunity will gradually close as, as the city of Brantford is able to service all of those lands and, and do all the necessary planning that they have to do on the lands that uh, were, were um, uh, conveyed to them through the boundary adjustment, but right right now, kind of we're the game in town, if you will. We got lots of land that's available for development. It's got its own issues, but uh, 
but uh, right now we're we're a game in town for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Councilor Pierce. Um, thanks, Rob. Uh, just a <coughs> question you said in regards to you know we're seeing today things that were approved 10, 15 mm -hmm. years ago, which is absolutely. Now you mentioned the, the, the Gulf North there. Yes. <coughs> yes. Now obviously, and, and that's that was brought up at a few of the meetings. Yes. Like that. But I think the important part to, to stay here is it may have been in the plan in 2000, but nowhere near the intensification that it is now with the the, the growth on top of that. You mean you mean the the most recent plan, the the well, the, the jump? You mean? Oh, I see where you're getting at. It wouldn't have been <coughs> 700 True, yeah. I, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, there was no growth plan in place at that time, right? I mean, that came out 2005, adopted in 2006 originally. So the growth plan, as uh, the, the first version of the growth plan hadn't even been adopted. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so had it, had it been developed with residential at that time, it likely would have looked like the areas around the high school right now. That subdivision would have, that, so the size of those lots likely would have continued out to that area. But things have changed, rules have changed. Yeah, as, as Jody mentioned in her presentation, we have to now comply with those growth plan targets and, those, and, and, and the changes that happen at the higher level, they all filter down to us and we have to make those changes. So you, you are starting to see a different type of development, no question. Council, I'm uh, sorry, Leferriere? Leferriere. My question it just jumps right off of that, which yeah. is, um, by my reading of, of your um, estimates of when we're going to grow yeah. and how much, we're going to be 13 years early uh, for the provincial target yeah. of growth. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is also that there was at one point in time brought to council a staged growth development plan? Yes, there was. And is it possible to request that staff do another to bring to this council around staging that growth? Uh, so that it meets the requirements of the province without mm -hmm. uh, getting us there 13 years early? Uh, the answer to that is yes, that's absolutely possible. Um, the staging of development report was um, brought to this council and uh, was uh, not approved by the council. It's, we can certainly bring it back upon request if council would like us to do that. Um, we, can, we can certainly do that. We would, that. I think we brought it forward over a year ago, I believe, but mm -hmm. um, we, we, we'd have to do some tweaks to it, but we could bring it back. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Howes. Specific to the infrastructure bullet point up there, I just had a question. Mm. If we improve the infrastructure mm -hmm. that's needed to, to sustain the growth that's in the pipeline already, yes. do we open the door to, since the infrastructure is better, then we're more ripe for more growth? on top of what's already in the pipeline? Um, I'll answer that in a, in a couple of slides from now because I'll talk, I'll, when I get into the, um, I know your, the Paris kind of slant, I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer that when we get to the Paris growth question because I, I can get into that a little bit. So with permission, I'll kind of move forward. Um, status of county development, we've got, we got three areas that are f truly fully serviced, Paris, St. George, and Canesville. Although Canesville is, um, fully serviced because it, it's, it's uh, sanitary capacity is limited by the sewage lagoons that are out there. Um, we would like to um, convert those sewage lagoons um, to uh, piped sanitary system uh, into the, uh, the city of Brantford. That was one of the, um, oh, help me out, Mr. CAO, the uh, economic. Uh, right, right. And the two areas that we looked at were for potential uh, uh, partnership with the with Brantford the airport area is one and Canesville was the other and the, the issue in Canesville is of course the sanitary capacity so uh, if uh, if we're able to to uh, to get into that system um, through discussions with Brantford that will uh, open up some potential development in Canesville but those are the three areas that are fully serviced some areas partially serviced Mount Pleasant water only um, St. George um, some areas have water some areas don't some areas are fully serviced um, um, airport areas partially serviced I would say even though it does have some sanitary provision but it's it's very very limited mostly just water in the airport area other areas such as our hamlets unserviced St. Uh, Burford Oakland Scotland totally unserviced no services there at all um, the places to the reason I'm saying these things are the places to grow legislation um, indicates that 
Growth shall be, and that's an interesting, you have to think of that term, shall be limited to the, to, in fully serviced areas. That's the focus of the growth plan, fully serviced areas. And only minor rounding out is permitted in the unserviced settlement areas. So Oakland, Scotland, Burford, minor rounding out within those, those areas only. And that's, again, direction from above down to us. That's the, that's the intent of those, of those plans. Um, so we get into some numbers. Um, the, the plans that we have currently either draft approved, registered, or in process, we got a total of roughly 8,500 units. And to assign a, a number of two and a half units per, two and a half people per unit gets you roughly 21,000 people. So there you go, that gets you up to the, close to the provincial target, pretty close to it. Um, 56,000 people. So if we issued that stuff over 15 years, that's 566 permits a year. We're already at, um, I was talking to our chief building official last week, 435 dwelling units this year. M more than double what we've ever done. Is it, is it a blip or is it uh, going to be a new trend or is it going to be, is it going to come down a bit? You know, we, we don't know. If you have a crystal ball that's a little clearer than mine, I'd love to see it. But I think that, I think we're going to start to see a, a, a higher trend in terms of the, the issuance of building permits than we've seen in the past number of years. Um, only because we've got a number of plans of subdivision that are all coming on at the same time um, using the infrastructure that we've got. And here's where I'll get into that. So this is, um, this is some of the councillors may have seen a lot of this stuff that I presented back in the, in the last education session we had. I think it was back in January of last year, but um, I'll walk people through some of this. So I'll start at the top. Uh, the Brookfield plan of subdivision, uh, right at the top end of Paris, um, up in this location, top of Grand River Street North. This is the plan of subdivision that you see up there. It's, if you haven't been up there in the past six months and you go up there now, it's going to look a lot different. Um, that thing popped up like a dandelion. Um, 413 units just within that, that plan of subdivision there, which includes that piece and that piece there. Um, the Rest Acres Road, uh, kind of power line uh, area, which, which I'll kind of refer to as this, this general area here <coughs> with uh, those plans of subdivision down there. Um, roughly 2,000 units when you add them all up, various, various plans of subdivision. Um, some of them were, uh, most of them down there were approved by the Ontario Municipal Board at the time. Um, Goosenbauer a plan of subdivision, sorry, I'm going to bounce back and forth. Goosenbauer is that very, very skinny piece at the, the north end up there adjacent to, to Brookfield. 76 units there. Um, that has gone through a recent uh, LPAT hearing, um, uh, on, uh, although under the old system. Um, Valerie Holmes is adjacent to that to the west, so right there, it's a system, and that's another 300 units roughly uh, in that area. Um, all of those units pertain to, or, or rather in, involve some of the improvements to Grand River Street North, and I'll get into that um, in a minute. Um, Nith Peninsula um, is this, this, parcel of sub, this parcel of land here, also affectionately referred to as the Barker's Bush area. Um, that plan of subdivision uh, is currently at the LPAT, again under the uh, old system, 539 units um, in that plan of subdivision. Um, Paris Grand Estates, this is the golf course, uh, this, this plan here, um, and that was recently approved um, at the LPAT, or through minutes of settlement, um, through 753 units. Um, live Communities um, is the this council actually dealt with. Kitty Corner to the Brand Sports Complex, which is right there, that's that plan of subdivision right there. That's 423 units. Um, almost all the other subdivisions were appealed to the, either the Ontario Municipal Board at the time or the, or the tribunal. Um, and finally, Kingwood, which is this, this, this parcel down here. Um, I haven't got a unit count for it, as you can see. I, I pulled the plan out and I see lots of blocks and shown on there, and, but they didn't have a unit count. So looking at the size of the area that's to be uh, developed with residential, I'm gonna guess it's roughly a couple hundred units there, adjacent to the, this, this portion of it's the residential portion in the official plan and the rest of it, we've got some employment and mixed use commercial down, down in that area there as well. So that's kind of a summary of Paris. I'll get to that question about how much further can we grow. If you think about all of these plans of subdivision, if we, if we meet that growth target, 13 years earlier, yeah, we could delay it and kind of drag it out a little bit. We're still going to meet our target by that date. 
The issue comes with the, the expansion of the Paris settlement boundary, so the, the boundary that goes around the entire um, portion of Paris. At some point, we're going to get inquiries from the development industry to say, you need to expand your settlement boundary because we are fully serviced. That's where the service is going to go. That can only be done through a municipal comprehensive review, which you control, not the developers. Councillor Ferrier. Yes. Everything within there could potentially be open for development if people were to buy and apply. Yes. Yes. Subject to infrastructure, subject to the necessary approvals, subject to um, uh, phasing if, if a staging a development plan were, uh, were brought to council and approved. But yeah, that is the settlement boundary. So everything within the settlement boundary is anticipated to be developed. Yeah. Back to uh, Councillor Howe's question. Yes. Yes. Then that's where that door opens to more development. So more infrastructure can potentially lead to more you know, support. To find another word to me. Um, yeah, it can be a precursor to future um, future growth. You you certainly don't. I mean, treatment plant expansions, for example, are very expensive. They take a long time to get approvals for. You don't want to have to do them too often. You you tend to try to build additional capacity into into the uh, into the plant. Because you don't, you don't want to become a community where um, you don't have growth. Some gro growth is a good thing. It, you, you, there are many, many communities, especially in the northern part of the province, that are declining. And you do not want to be living in one of those communities because you, your tax base is shrinking. Your services are, are the same or shrinking. You know, a, little, a bit of growth, it's, it's how much, it's that balance of how much is, is appropriate, right? That's the, that's the tough call to make. But you, having growth is, is from an economic driver point of view is a, very, is a good thing. Councillor Bell, I think you were next. We, yeah. I'm not aware of anything, but it would be pr quite. Um, we we could do it through the through Statistics Canada or um, the the statistics that are available to us on the census. Hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of some of that for Paris especially, will be coming through the Paris Master Servicing uh, Study Review that we're doing um, because we've, we've hired a consultant to, the, as Jody mentioned, you have, you have applicants that are here for their, their issue, their interest, right? So we've, we've hired a consultant who's looking at the big picture in terms of what are all of our requirements from wastewater, sanitary, storm, um, and, and they're going to give us a, a bigger picture issue in terms of what's happening in, in the Paris area because it is our largest area, it's fully serviced. What do we need to do? Where are our bottlenecks? So that's, that information will be forthcoming in the, in this year, I believe. So I have to check with uh, Public Works on that because they're, they're the project manager on that piece. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, I would ask the same question before the uh, um, areas that are fully serviced. Mm -hmm. like yeah, yeah, okay, I get that. Within the, the legislative time frame, yeah, um, I, I'd have to go back and look at each individual one. But some of them were, some of them that were there um, due to the recent changes to the OMB slash LPAT system. Um, that's the case for Nith Peninsula. Um, that was appealed for that reason, um, and that's the case for Valerie was a non-decision. So they were beyond the time frame, but but um, under the old system. So those two, and there was at least, and there were two in St. George that were the, that way. Oh, so there's only the Nith Peninsula? I think so. Paris? I think. The other ones are all 
Because of the well, you didn't. Well, no, like like I mentioned, the, the only one that council got to make the final decision on was that one, live communities. So there was no decision granted on. So they, essentially, they were all appealed for lack of decision, right, within the time frame. Now, I mean, the, the time frames are, the time frames are um, what they are under the regulations of the Act: 150 days for a zone change and 210, 210 for a plan of subdivision. That's not a long period of time when you think of the work that goes into developing a subdivision, all the various studies and things like that that uh, uh, Joni mentioned that have to be completed. That time goes by very quickly. I think you'd all agree that the past four years went by very quickly for those that were on that are on council. Um, it's 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 not it's not uncommon for a, a plan of subdivision to go beyond the the time frame. Develop, developers often know that. They feel if, they're, if staff are working with them to try and resolve the issues, there's, they don't feel the need to appeal. They just kind of keep going and they, they ultimately get it resolved. Other times, like this year, with uh, the change in the, the appeal uh, process, some developers chose to appeal because they could. They were in a position to do that. Can you explain to us, so the developer appeals And we haven't seen the plan of subdivision, but it's going to the LPAD or mm -hmm. OMB, whatever. Do they make the decision and we don't get to comment at all? Because we haven't even seen mm -hmm. some of these plans of subdivision. Yes. Off, I mean, you, you would have at least seen the information meeting. Because that's the first meeting where they, they, they bring forward the application. Right, so you would have at least seen that. Um, what you may not have seen is the, the, the final um, formal public meeting under the Planning Act where you're given the opportunity to make a, make a decision. But you would have at least seen it one time. And then often developers will wait, the, the clock starts ticking and they will just wait until the 211th day and they'll just appeal. Now, I, I think that may change. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it unfolds, how the new LPAT system unfolds. It, I think it's fair to say that under the previous OMB model, um, I think it was um, in the developer's interests to appeal because they got what was called a de novo hearing or a brand, brand new hearing, a hearing, a hearing brand new. So the, they, the, the OMB had the same authority as council. It's not exactly the same way under the LPAT system, and Jody talked about that a little bit. A little bit. You know, you, you can say, you can refuse it, it can go to the LPAT, they can send it back to you. It's 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 a little more in the in the council's favor because as Jody mentioned the the, the LPAT has to have consideration for count the council decision, right? So that's a little more in your favor. But I mean we try to. Um, I think we've done that on the other appeals that we've dealt with. Uh, the, the golf course is one one example. We've we've brought we've brought items to council on uh, uh, on an in camera uh, basis to get some some legal advice from from council in terms of processing things. So you're updated that way, um, but yeah, once it's appealed, it's it's kind of out of your hands, right? It be go it goes to that that LPAT system. That's that is a flaw, I think, with respect to the planning system, is that it gets it gets appealed and then it goes into this black hole or vacuum where the the public don't really get a chance to to have a public meeting about an application. So that's that's a bit of a flaw in the system, but it's we don't make those rules, I'm afraid. Uh, we'll move along. A couple of projects in St. George that people should know about. Empire, uh, this, that's the portion up here in the northwestern part of St. George. Um, 800 to 1,000 units up there. It's a range because sometimes re developers will register what are called lotless blocks. So it's a, just a big block of land on a plan of subdivision. And once it's registered as a block, you can go through what's called part lot control, where you come, you bring a bylaw before council, and council approves a bylaw that exempts that block of land from being from a requirement that it be approved to get chopped up. We can just chop it up into 20 units or 15 units or 10 units or whatever they need. Some de sometimes developers like using lotless blocks because it gives them flexibility to, to, to address market. If they feel townhouses are selling well, then they'll put some townhouses in. If they think singles are selling well at the time, then they'll put some singles in. Gives them a bit of flexibility. Uh, Losani uh, also owns this large chunk uh, hatched in red here. Um, on the south side of Highway 5, uh, 1,300 to 1,700 units, by far the biggest plan in St. George. 
An item that came up in Jody's presentation was the schools. We've been talking to the school boards, plural, with respect to schools in both of these potential plans. So what happens is the school board actually reserves blocks of land within those plans of subdivision. And then if at the time they need those schools, they, they need that land, they will acquire that land and put a school on the property. Um, what, the plant, what the developers will do is actually ghost in underneath a potential street pattern. So if the school board doesn't acquire it, well, there's, you've, got a, you've got a street pattern that's all ready to go and be developed. Yes, Councillor Howes. Uh, just back to the uh, previous question specific to that and part of our learning curve here. Um, it's the county that connects with the school board to outline these future plans not the developer? Uh, correct. The county circulates the school boards. Um, and in the, in the uh, greatest, great example is St. George. Um, we had circulated the school boards and hadn't really got much of a response from the school boards with respect to the growth in St. George. So we reached out to them and, and had separate meetings with the school boards and said, look, there's, there's a lot of growth coming here. Are you, really, are you, are you piecing all these plans together and doing the math because we we think that it's underserved from a school point of view and ultimately they said yes they are and so we ended up getting plans uh, lands in both of those plans for for potential school sites um, where it ends up we don't know um, but um, we'll work with the the boards and the developers to to come up with the best site so the the, the developer um, provides the land but the county coordinates with the school board um, the county does and with the developer because I mean the, the it's it is the developers plan of subdivision we have to work with them to try and establish the best location we try to, to do them in um, what are called hubs right so you can you can get a potential school along with potential library so we work with our our library folks to get a potential library work with our parks people to get a potential meeting room space for for the neighborhood associations that kind of thing so it's a real coordination effort with with a lot of a lot of different staff members to make those things happen um, two more, Riverview, which is um, uh, Pine Best Homes. They, they, that, little tr that little rectangle in there is, is owned by them. Uh, it's uh, about 100 units in that little section. And the, uh, the services basically from the sewage treatment plant, which are here, kind of come up and across and across there's lands and then up into, up into the Empire area. And then Brant Terra is 90 units, which is kind of a filling out of the existing uh, plant of subdivision in the very, very northeast corner of, of, uh, of St. George. Um, of all of the plans and current developments in that area, that plan, is, that plan of subdivision is the furthest along and the most uh, um, likely to, develop, to be developed next. They've got, their pipes are in the ground, they've got a lot of, um, uh, some blocks there that are there but just not registered yet. Councillor Wheat. capacity in the plant and um, we're, work, we're working with that through public works right now. And there was a phasing plan brought forward to this committee uh, prepared by uh, Fujita on how to develop in St. George. So that, that phasing plan has already been approved by PAC, which is us right now, and then ultimately approved by Council Clerk. Is a phasing plan in St. George? Right, that was part of the OPA for, for the St. George area, which essentially um, uh, in the in the OP at St. George had had the settlement boundary area, which was quite enormous. But in terms of being fully serviced, only the only this this portion here is fully serviced. Um, the sanitary does not go past that that point to the west. So we made that adjustment in our official plan to divide them into a primary and secondary areas. One's fully serviced, one's partial. Um, George, unless there's any further questions there. Michael.
Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that is an excellent point. The, the time it takes to get the approvals to do a lot of this infrastructure expansion, it, it takes a significant amount of time to get these approvals. A long time. Um, I'm going to talk about the airport area a little bit. There's three plans of subdivision down near the airport, um, partially serviced. Um, we'll kind of walk, walk you through them here. Uh, the first one is uh, the Lauderdale Developments. Uh, they, they often change names and have different names, but people might recognize this one as the Haggerty Plan of Subdivision or Summit. 35 lots in this area, uh, partially serviced, water only. Um, all three plans that I'll show you here are all related to the uh, elevated water tower that we're trying to, to get constructed down near the airport so that we can get the water pressures that we need to provide the, um, uh, the water to these, uh, to these plans. Um, it, me, we've, all three of them have come to a, an information meeting uh, before the Planning Advisory Committee, so we're kind of in the process right now of resolving some of these issues. They're all relatively small plans of subdivision. They're all about 30 to, 30 to 20 to 40 lots in around that kind of range. Um, this one in particular, it's very right, directly adjacent to the airport, so there's issues of noise. There's some employment area to the north, and we have to deal with a buffer for that. Um, the next one is the Green Road plan of subdivision, 23 lots. Um, partially serviced again, uh, water only. So these will all have septic facilities as their sanitary treatment. Again, tied to the elevated tank. Um, compatibility with uh, some of the abutting residential lots. This this abutting uh, plan of subdivision right here. Some of the existing existing residents in that plan of subdivision came out and said that development beside them wasn't compatible with what they had. Um, so that's one of the things we heard. And the other one was an, impa an impact on a potential. Uh, uh, drainage ditch that kind of flows through here. So those are issues that we're working through with, uh, with the developer on um, to, to, in order to bring that forward. And finally, the Forest Road plan of subdivision, 23 lots, uh, partially service, again, tied to the elevated tank. Um, we heard about safe road access. This Forest Road itself is very, very hilly, especially right in through this, uh, this little section here. Um, I wouldn't want to be going down that in a freezing rainstorm, but um, so we've worked with the developer to revise it and get an entrance out onto, uh, onto Oak Hill Drive. Um, and also the intersection back here at, at Colborne Street. You get all of these little incremental pieces of the puzzle that start to get built and then all of a sudden this, this, this intersection becomes a problem. So that's going to be an issue that we'll be resolving with the developer or release raising. So Jody talked a little bit about um, uh, the various different types, subdivisions, zone changes, site plans. Got some site plan approvals that we're dealing with as well. It's, as Jody mentioned, a little bit of overlap here, but it's kind of the last piece of the puzzle before somebody can get a building permit. Again, not appealable by the area residents because by that time, the principle of the land use has been established, so there shouldn't really be anything to appeal. The developer can appeal, but, we, but the, the neighbors can't. Typically, you see it for industrial, commercial, institutional projects. Um, there is a limited list of things we can ask for under Section 41 of the Planning Act, and I've listed some of them there, road widenings, walkways, things like that. We can control architecture to some degree, but you have to have policies in your official plan to do that. Jody mentioned things like um, architectural guidelines. Those, those are the types of things that council can adopt in order to, to assist with some of that. And we take agreements and securities to make sure that developers perform. And we give them a time frame. Usually it's a year. You have a year to complete your site plan. Um, we don't want to get approvals for something and then having it last sitting vacant for 10 years while all the, the rules and regulations change and then somebody comes in and says, hey, I got my approved plan, I give me a building permit. So we give people a time frame to do it. Councilor Ferrier. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so it says here, a limited list of items staff can request. Now they'd be requesting that, uh, you, you mentioned uh, some official plan, but can that be requested? Uh, essentially that, that comes through the pushing of council as to whether those are seen as priority uh, for each individual uh, site, or is it for sites as a whole? Yeah, we as as a staff, we will look at um, as Jody mentioned. Each each site is a little different. I mean, we will we will look at each site and determine. Okay, does this site need to have concrete curbs, or does our our concrete bumper stops appropriate because it's in a more rural area? Does it have to have paving, or does or can 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 recycled asphalt do in, in storage areas out in the back 40, so to speak. You know, there, these are the kinds of things that staff can deal with. We can ask for any of this stuff, but is it a, is always appropriate to do that? And that's kind of a balance. Is we, it then helpful for council to, 
uh, maybe discuss and approve or not approve items such as, uh, you know, blanket, um, some, some more blanket planning such as uh, requiring uh, groundwater absorption or um, mm. things like specific chemical use uh, that, that is and isn't allowed in developments or even things like I see lighting, you know, like mm. uh, light pollution, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is, is becoming an issue. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Is that something that as a council we can make some more blanket recommendations or approvals on or what's that process? Well, some of those the matters you just mentioned there are covered through different processes like um, chemicals and things like that that would, that would likely be covered through our source water protection right. um, uh, work that that we have uh, our consultant working on and um, things like lighting the kind of, kind of like detailed design stuff we can certainly use uh, tools any additional tools that you can give us are good so the guidelines for for site plan approval that help n narrow down and prevent some of these problems those things are very helpful for us um, that's it's kind of been a matter on our to-do list to start to kind of get some of that stuff rolling, but <clears throat> with this, with the new council, that, that, that could come forward as well. Um, but certainly, so assistance from you goes a long way because when we ask for things from a developer, we say, no, your, your street lights have to be this style, and <clears throat> pardon me, it can only have this many, um, um, what's the term for lighting? Ampage. Pardon? Lumens. Lumens, Lumens, you know, in, in terms of the, the amount of light that can, and we have to direct it downward. Well, often a developer will say, well, that's not the standard I use. Well, sorry, this is a council approved recommendation. You know, that, that goes a long way to, to assist staff as a tool to getting, for, for, to getting developers to provide us with the things that you would like to see as a council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, some of the, I just listed a few of the site plans that we're typically, that we're working on. We're, we deal with, we've got, probably 50 or 60 of these things going on at any one time because years overlap, right? Something that comes in in January isn't going to be approved till next spring or summer or what have you. And so we're dealing with all kinds of different files all the time. Some of the ones that are on the front burner for us right now, uh, Vicano has a project on Rest Acres Road, commercial, commercial plaza. You, often you see the signs out along uh, Rest Acres. Um, that's about 11,000 square meters. Um, Adi Dossler has, uh, on Chris, uh, Chris Carson has a project there, office warehouse in our business park, working on that. Uh, to Willow Street, um, uh, on the other side of the, uh, of the river here in Paris, there's an infill, infill project there with 75 units. Um, that, that's, we're, just, we're just concluding that one. It should be, should be wrapping up, uh, starting the road, road improvements on that one, hopefully this spring, getting that done. Um, Schuyler Estates, that's at the top end of Paris. We've got a 55 unit residential infill project. That's moving forward in phases, but there's still a little bit of an OMB approval that has to get tidied up there. Um, the cannabis facility out on Middletown Line Road, and I put in brackets, that's been bumped up. Councillor Miller has requested a bump up of that, so that'll be coming back to this council for consideration. And fire halls and OPP stations, just examples of the types of projects that we deal with at the staff level. Those are typically, <clears throat> those are not typically, they are normally deferred to uh, the general manager for his for his signature and in in Mark's absence I can sign on his behalf so that's not usually a, uh, a council process unless it's bumped up by council for for uh, a reason that, that you can give council can bump it up staff can bump it up um, app the residents can request it to get bumped up through a counselor uh, what are we doing to prepare for growth Michael talked about um, wastewater um, uh, EA in um, St. George, and that's on the list. Uh, Rest Acres Road, we've completed an EA there. You're starting to see the development of, of that with uh, the new roundabout that's opened up. More to come next year in, the, in next year's redevelopment there. Grand River Street North, that's the class EA that um, a lot of the Paris councillors are concerned about, uh, especially on the north end. Uh, we anticipate completion of that class EA uh, next year. Um, it's um, uh, the next. Uh, large public meeting I believe is going to be in um, January I believe at this point but I don't think we've nailed down the date yet um, Bishopsgate Road interchange is another uh, another class CA that one is complete it's just a matter of um, uh, funding and getting it uh, uh, availability to construct that that new round that new uh, interchange St. George I talked about um, wastewater for the existing built-up area in Canesville I mentioned that a little bit in terms of tying into the Branford system a couple of matters that aren't Class CAs, but I, we've got on the list because they're high-level uh, studies. Um, new DC bylaw next year. Um, it expires next August, I believe it is, Mr. <coughs> CAO. Um, so 2019 it expires, so we need a new one by that time. So we're, right now we're doing all of the necessary background work to, to decide which projects are going to be in that DC bylaw and 
then working with uh, our consultant who's Watson and Associates to come up with a rate, a DC rate, um, and then uh, adopting the bylaw so that all of those, those projects can, can move forward. Um, Paris Master Servicing Study, which I mentioned earlier. Some of the, some of the high level stuff that we're working on. Um, some of the changes to how we, we do our planning. Um, developers have driven growth recently here in the county. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, without that staging of development report that was mentioned earlier, it's, um, it, it's been, here's my application, please process it. That's, we've had a lot of that. And um, I think we, we need to drive some of that, some of that work, some of those projects, um, especially from, from a, a large infrastructure point of view. Um, for instance, if we need, it's much cheaper and much more uh, efficient for us to have one large stormwater management facility than to have four plans of subdivision with eight different ponds, for instance. We can have one large pond we, which we have to own and maintain. It's, it makes more sense to do that. The Gurney outlet was, was a good example um, for the new councillors. If you don't know what that is, come and see me and I'll, if you got half a day, I'll explain it to you. Um, um, I've got down here, be a greenfield player like other municipalities like Milton and Vaughan. I'm not saying there that we're gonna become Milton and Vaughan, but what I am saying is that we have to have our processes in place in order to deal with the growth that we're gonna be getting. That's, that's the big piece that we have to have in place. Uh, future considerations for, for you as a council. Oh, yes. No, I, I agree. Um, I don't think we do. I don't think we do necessarily want to be. Um, but from a processing point of view, if we're going to be dealing with the significant amount of growth that we're going to be getting, I think we need the processes in place to do that. Staging of development is a great example. So, let's let us go that way. Yeah. Have a good link to people in your position in Milton and Vaughan that you can draw experience from? Yes. So, I mean, you're working that for ourselves. That's what, that's what we had done. Absolutely. So, you're happy to steal the people's best practice? Uh, beg, borrow, steal, that's the planner's mantra. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that. Count Mr. CAO, were you going to challenge me? You know, I, I wouldn't mind just speaking to that too. Uh, and uh, somebody just texted me to turn my mic on and asked me to remind everyone to turn their mics on because that's how the, uh, the folks on YouTube can hear what we're saying. So <laughs> um, what I want to say to, to that is, is a, a Greenfield player, it's not as much maybe about becoming those municipalities, but, but acting like them in different ways. And we spent quite a bit of time over the last two years uh, learning about that. And part of it was uh, making sure that our fee structure is in place both is actually the three steps, the, the muscle, that's the, yeah. the, the staff, so that we've got good policy planners and we've got good um, process planners that we can, we can keep ahead of the timelines that we talked about. Rob's going to get to them here. The fuel, which is the, uh, is, is the, is the fees, so that growth is planning for growth, so that the, the existing taxpayer isn't paying for development, whether you know, it wasn't, isn't paying for, for us to facilitate the, the, the developer's projects. And then, as, as Rob mentioned, the processes, make sure we have, and, and he'll talk about this. But so so that, that's, that's part of the, the, you know, being a greenfield player. It's not just about you know, turning in our, ourselves into Milton, which I agree. I don't think um, th this previous council or your staff feel is, is, is where, where, where this municipality wants to go. But we do need to be reflect, or we don't have to be cognizant that we are in this, in this we're, we're, we're at the landing, the landing point for people leapfrogging the, the, the green belt. Sorry, Rob, I stole your next slide, but to talk about what being a greenfield player means. And, and uh, we, we did a fairly comprehensive de development approvals review process over the last two years, made a large number of recommendations. We've been implementing all those recommendations. You'll see pieces of those recommendations moving into the 2019 budget as well. And, uh, and that's, that's, what, that's what these are about. So. Right. Um, so future considerations for, for you as council. Where, where do you want to put your limited resources uh, in order to achieve provincial growth targets? We know the growth targets are there. Where do, you want, where do you get the biggest bang for your buck? Do you put it into a sanitary sewer that provides availability for four developers, or do you stick it over here for one developer? Oh, how do you stage that? How do you phase it? Things like that. Um, again, I talked about our new development charges bylaw. That's a big piece of this. Another piece that, that we've been working toward that I think we still need to work toward is obtaining necessary approvals from the province to to do things that, that currently require provincial approval, and I got down there in ECA. Um, 
which is an environmental compliance approval. Have I got that right, Mark? I believe so. Planners are bad for acronyms, and I apologize for that. Um, we need to go to the province to get approval for an oil grit separator that would go into a parking lot for a commercial development. And I really question where is the public interest, in, or the, not public, provincial interest. Where is the provincial interest in an oil grit separator? I, I really question that. And I think, pardon me? In an oil grit separator for, for, that goes within a parking lot, and it's part of a catch basin, you know, the water goes into the catch basin. It needs provincial approval. And it's like, why? Why do we need that? And why can't we get that downloaded to us? We've got some qualified staff on board now. Let's, let's push for that. That's the kind of stuff that um, I think is, is something that we should push for. That should be delegated to the local level. So just an example. Again, some of the higher level stuff, some of the broader growth issues that you, uh, that you have to consider. Jody touched a little bit about this in her presentation. And it regards com complete communities. I mean, all of the growth that you're seeing um, in, in Paris and St. George and, and all the other communities, they all lead to um, in schools, infrastructure, the emergency services, the, the use of the parks and trails. We have to develop all of that. Um, pedestrian connectivity. Do, are, we, are we making sure people can get around? Can they get around not necessarily in a car? You know, thing, things like that. Do we have a, an appropriate mix of land uses so people don't have to get in their car to necessarily drive across the river to get a loaf of bread or something like that? These are, these are things that we have to deal with. Um, Michael talked a little bit about the servicing and capital investment, how you deal with these things for your budget. Um, transportation impacts we have to look at. We have to look at not only what's happening on the street, but the, the bigger level. And traffic calming is, is uh, uh, an LID. I didn't have LID on there. Local. Low impact development, I got it. Um, and traffic calming. I mean, this is a this is an example of a uh, of a roundabout that was um, retrofitted uh, in a community um, that I used to work in. It used to be a four-way stop. It was retrofitted. Um, it was retrofitted at a cost to the municipality of one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. If we had done it right the first time, the developer would have paid for it. But the developer put in a four-way stop with four stop signs. And then the municipality had to come back after the fact and, and re retrofit it. So get, getting it right the first time is an important piece for, for all of us. Michael talked about that. Won't talk about that. And we're done. So questions? Councillor Miller. Uh, just a, a quick question. And, you, and, you, <laughs> and I was going to ask it, and you mentioned it right at the end. Low impact development. Um, and you know yourself, we talk about the timeline, 10 years, 20 years, and everything I've seen tells me that uh, the storms are going to be, you know, the rain's going to be a little a little harder, a little more, a little faster, all that stuff. So to me, I think, I think low impact development is kind of a, something that's required. And, and how do we get that through? Do, uh, how do we push that, I guess? Do we do it through our policies or do we do it through site plan or... Um, I, I would suggest to you that that we are we are doing it and we have been doing it for quite a number of years it's just become kind of the flavor of the month in terms of the uh, the, the language um, I know that the the requirement to do low impact development is is mandated through the ministry Ministry of Environment so that's it's not something that we can choose to do it's something that we're required to do so that's that would be my first thought of it um, the only thing that concerns me about low impact development is you can't Again, I have an issue with applying the same brush stroke to everything. Because you can, there's a big, big difference between having the ability to do low impact development in an area that's sands and gravels and an area that's on a dag of clay. Mm -hmm. Very, very different, right? And yet, they're dealt with the same. And I don't think that's accurate. I don't think that's a, a wise move. I think, I think you have to, if, you can, if you're able to do low impact development, that's a good thing. I just don't think it's appropriate everywhere. It's, it's, it's very, very difficult to do infiltration in clay. It's very difficult. And um, yeah, I, I think Sorry, I, I don't want to debate the issue, but um, yeah. tonight, <laughs> um, but I mean, there's things you can do everywhere. Uh, you know, rain barrels is a good example. You oh, know, yeah. We could mandate that for, that's just, mm -hmm. I'm just, just one example. But mm -hmm. I mean, in your, uh, what are we doing to prepare for growth slide? <laughs> it's interesting you use the example, large regional storm water management facilities. Mm -hmm. in, in my brain, 
we don't need to make these re large regional storm water management facilities as large <laughs> if we did a lot of these things that could, you know what I mean, right, um, right. offset the amount of water coming out. So that, I mean, that's how I see it. And I, I really, um, I really believe we should be pushing that. So yeah, no, and I, th um, in response, I would agree. I would agree wholeheartedly. <clears throat> um, I think when I say large facilities, I, 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 what I'm suggesting is that. I don't. I, I would prefer to have one facility dealing with the stormwater management from multiple developments than have each development have two or three ponds. Right? It's a lot easier to own and maintain one than it is to own and maintain five or six. Okay, but I, I will. I, I will keep pushing that issue. So. I know you will. John Pierce, uh, thank you through you. So, just kind of a. <clears throat> a I'm looking for your um, thoughts on this. It's not necessarily a question per se. But we talk about, you know, over the next, you know, by 2041, 57,000 people. So that's 20,000 people in the next seven to 10 years in one of your slides there. Mm. And then you suggest that potentially with what would be required to be done in St. George with the wastewater could potentially take seven to 10 years to build a new one, retrofit the old one, yada, yada. So does that mean that with the with what's already on the books for Paris, that there's our twenty thousand people, and then we don't go anywhere else. Um, I'd have to do the math, but I, I don't I don't think there's enough just in Paris to make it happen. And the other piece that we have to deal with in Paris is the is the the, the wastewater treatment plant plant at Paris. We have we have uh, there, there are going to be some uh, issues not in the short term, but in the long term that we have to deal with there too. So I think. It's, I, think, I see the development as kind of uh, flopping back and forth between Paris and St. George to a great degree. We're working in a lot in Paris right now because we have the capacity, we have water, we have sanitary, things like that. In a few years' time, hopefully the, the Class CA in, in St. George will get completed and the plant will get constructed again. As you say, five, six year construction time period when by the time mm -hmm. you're done the design, construction, things like that. So then, then uh, development will ramp up in the St. George area as it starts to kind of come down a little bit in Paris. That's kind of how I see it. I don't see it happening both at the same time. There might be a bit, a bit of overlap, but. Okay, so you talk about the, the Paris wastewater plant there. Yep. At what point do you figure we're gonna have to do work on that? In Paris? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know the exact time frame yet because that's exactly the item that the GM Blue Plan Group is looking at through the Paris Master Servicing Study. Uh, they're doing the analysis right now. A lot of it depends on the, the, the population growth, how quickly it grows, how quick, quickly we grow, how much can we get out of what we've got currently before we have to add to it. Um, some of it depends on um, infiltration of pipes that we have in the ground. So there's some of them are more prone to uh, infiltration from uh, water outside the pipe getting into the, the, the sanitary pipe. So we're basically treating rainwater or groundwater, which is not, not a good thing. Mm. But um, but I think I think from a um, I'm going from memory here, but I believe the um, the GM Blue Plan folks felt that the the existing system was fairly tight. Um, but it's one of the considerations that every municipality has to deal with. Not all of our infrastructure is brand new. We've, everybody's got old stuff that leaks, and so we all have to deal with that. But um, that that'll be coming forward through their their review with the Pastor Ma Paris Master Servicing Study. Okay. Thanks, Member Goward. Thank you. Um, on page 38 of the PowerPoint, it says the last bullet, only minor rounding out permitted in unserviced settlement areas. And as an example, they've used Oakland, Scotland, and Burford. Now, none of those areas have municipal water or sewers. So when you say minor rounding out, is that a few lots here and a few lots there within the settlement boundary? Um, I, I would say that's fringe? yeah, kind of a, kind of around the fringe of the existing built-up area. Um, let me just see if I've got a I've got a few maps here. And and <clears throat> what would be considered minor? How many lots? <laughs> Talked a lot about that tonight, haven't we? What's minor? Um, there is a there is a plan that's come uh, that's brought forward in um, Oakland right now on the the westerly part of the of the hamlet and I believe it's got I'm going to say 14 to 20 lots on it I can't remember off the top of my head but 23 23, 23 lots but that that little that small plan of subdivision takes that that hamlet to the limit of the settlement boundary 
that's what I would consider a minor rounding out. <clears throat> Whereas, uh, I don't want to, I'm trying to think of an example. So if you took any of the other hamlets, um, if, there was a, if there was a large area that, had, that was designated for development, and somebody, if, if, the, if the settlement boundary was, the existing settlement was this way, and somebody wanted to put a, a brand new subdivision way up here, like way, way outside the existing settlement boundary, that would be something that would be untoward the growth plan. It'd be still within the settlement boundary, but that's not a minor rounding out of the settlement boundary. You're kind of filling in gaps, you know, you're kind of taking it a little bit further to get to the edge of the settlement boundary, but it's definitely not intended to be a, let's put a brand new subdivision in the middle of what is currently an agricultural field on an unserviced parcel of land. Okay. So minor could be three lots or 20? 20. 23. Could be. Yep. Could be. In fact, that Oakland plan, we, we had discussions with the province on that very issue when that plan got submitted because I was worried that the province was going to say, nope, that's not a minor rounding out of that community. And, and I would wonder about that because it almost doubles the, yeah. the size of the, um, the village. 23? Mm, okay. I haven't counted recently, but Take your perhaps word for it. on the west side of County Road 24. Okay. Perhaps. It's the water I'm concerned oh, about. Yeah. And, and the percolation, because it's basically um, to the um, south, very much gravel, but that'll all be looked at. Now, Councillor Miller will be all over that. <laughs> Councillor Wheat. Classic example of rounding out is the southern part of Glen Morris. We've had two little yes. subdivisions there. Yep. And we just another good example. We just approved another one on yep. the west side of East River Road as you're approaching right. Glen Morris. There's the approval been granted right. there. That's what's called minor rounding out. Yeah. Of, Rounds out the settlement hammer. right to there the settlement two, boundary. In the last 20 years, we did one and we did another one both on the east side of East River, West River Road and now we've approved another one on the west side yeah. right across the road. That's rounding out of a hamlet. John Bell. Um, somebody else just told me to put the mic on as well. The, the one thought comes to mind is that the project that was approved recently in Burford, which was yes. five times the number you've just talked about, I think yes. it's 115. It hasn't, hasn't been approved yet. Uh, it's been approved by council, but it requires <laughs> site plan approval. Wow. So, wow. Uh, approved at least in this body. Yeah. But um, that, to me, opened up an avenue of thought that, that that's not using uh, council provided sewage treatment, council Correct. provided water, and yet it's a sizable development. Mm -hmm. Is there more potential within the county to have that kind of development? In I would suggest that there, there may be opportunities, but you have to, you have to balance that against the growth plan uh, requirements to have the minor rounding out. Right? I, I think there would have to be a discussion with the province in terms of, you know, we want to put a large plan of subdivision over here service with a membrane technology sewage treatment plant, for instance, and have it, have it be a, a major growth area in an unserviced area. That we would have to have a discussion with the province on, I think. Yeah, so that, that leads me to a more general point of, it, is there any opportunity to, I won't call it negotiate, but at least offer alternatives and challenge mm -hmm. to uh, the, the provincial authorities, if you've got logic behind you and mm -hmm. reason and good sound economic and social arguments, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my hope <coughs> I'm just being naive. <laughs> um, I, I think I think to some degree it'll it'll. Uh, the, what's the what's the Shakespearean line? The proof of the pudding will be in the eating. Uh, you know, I think the uh, um, the development in Burford it will be uh, an interesting development if we can get it going. Uh, they need a lot of approvals yet to make that happen. Um, so by no means is it over the finish line. So it's going to be some time before we can use that as an example. I think. Anyone else? Oh, Seeing none? Just one other comment. Site alteration, it's adopted under the Municipal Act. It's run through our department. Lori Fox deals with site alteration. I just wanted to mention that because that came up earlier. I jotted that down on my thing to, to mention. If somebody has a question about that, you can come and talk to me. But, okay. Thank you, Rob. Okay. I'll recommend a five-minute recess. You're all good. Oh.
because we've been here for over two hours. <laughs> Everyone will be subdued. Yeah, I know. yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. Actually, my color palette is earth tones, and that's what I like. Blues don't work with me. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to be talking a bit about the Planning Advisory Committee and what sort of things you can expect and, and, and uh, what occurs at these meetings. Um, for many of you, you're very well experienced, but many of you are not, so. So what happens at the Planning Advisory Committee? We often refer to it as PAC. As Rob said earlier, we love acronyms. This is one you're gonna be hearing quite a bit. So in short, PAC hears and makes decisions on Planning Act applications during the, planning, uh, the PAC meetings, very simple. Type of application you're going to be hearing are plans of subdivisions and condominiums. Condominiums can be in different forms, and you'll see a few different coming through. They could be a conventional condominium of apartments or townhouses, or they can be vacant land condominiums, or some hybrids in between them. You'll hear amendments to the official plan and zoning bylaw. Occasionally, staff will bring forward initiated applications um, by the municipality. You'll hear temporary use bylaws, holding bylaws, and other, and other ones will be coming through. In some cases, there has been delegated approval. You've heard this earlier. Site plan approval is one of them. Uh, it's been delegated to staff, can be bumped up at any request. It doesn't require a resolution. 
to be passed, a recommendation to be passed by council. It can just be a request. In some cases, we've seen conversations happening on applications here. Staff have looked at, if it doesn't get bumped up by council, we probably would do that. So that can happen as well. Staff can do that if we think it's in the best interest. Committee of Adjustment is another one, and certainly Councillor Bell's very aware of this. Uh, and they've been delegated the approval to deal with minor variances and severance applications. Um, certainly when I started here, the application severances, uh, severance applications we were dealing with numbered up into 100 and 125 a year at times. Um, the PAC meeting itself, there was really three type of applications or reports and presentations that you will be seeing coming to the meetings. There's information reports. Rob talked about that earlier uh, with some of the subdivision applications. We have a two, a two meeting system for applications. The first one is the information reports. It's initially introduced the applications and talk about what happens. Another application type that you'll hear at the meeting is a recommendation reports where reports, uh, recommendations are brought forward to PAC. They're written by planning staff for your consideration. And then we have other ones which I kind of consider more like functional reports or special reports on policy. It can be statistical reports such as uh, um, development and growth that's happened. It could be special reports on policy such as new initiatives coming down from the province. So the information reports. Uh, the reports by staff contain an overview of the application that's been submitted. It'll include a request of the, uh, that's been submitted or the application itself. Location, it'll discuss provincial planning matters such as places to grow. Uh, the official plan designation on the property. Zoning bylaw uh, com uh, designations on property as well. Uh, a summary of the issues known at that time and that's the reason we have the information reports and the presentations initially is that um, to get additional information coming in from the public. And at that time, uh, PAC members can certainly ask any questions of staff to clarify uh, what the application's about, if there's issues or things like that that they need clarification on. Then what will happen is that the, there'll be a presentation by the applicant or their consultant. Um, and PAC again can ask questions. Often you'll hear with the presentation that's done by staff, it goes through a lot of the detail. The applicants often come up and say, it pretty much explained everything. We're, we're here to answer any questions, and we've seen that in the past. And then we'll offer up uh, an opportunity for, to get input from the public. Um, we give notices to the public in accordance with the Planning Act. Uh, depending on the type of application, certainly with the zoning bylaw and official plan amendments, is 120 meters from the perimeter of the property. Uh, applications for severances, I believe, are 60 meters, and I think minor variances might be 30. Um, but those are ones, a uh, question that came up earlier, I thought I'd clarify that. Um, and the whole purpose of this is to get sense from the public. Often applications, when they're sent out there, the public receives them, they come in, and they raise their own issues. And that allows us the opportunity to go back and include it as part of the consideration package. So there could be new issues that come up that we don't know about, we've heard it from the public. Mm -hmm. And it's important to say that at this information presentation, there are no decisions that are made. The purpose really is to get feedback from the public, staff go off, and then they'll report back with recommendation and the presentations on the recommendation this is staff's reports with recommendations and it's based on their professional opinions as planners and you've heard this mentioned before so the planners are going to be looking at a lot of the information that's been collected over through the application conforming with the official plan uh, growth plan things like that they're very similar reports to the information sessions it's just they're kind of beefed up a bit it contains issues that have been uh, brought up, how those issues have been resolved. It'll look at comments that have been received by the public um, and, uh, and agencies. So it could be the Grand River Conservation Authority could bring up issues related to slope stability or hazard. These sorts of things come into the application and the planners will address those. And as part of that, uh, the, the report, it has a discussion on the merits of the application, conformity with the official plan, appropriateness. It can, well, certainly subdivision looks at the appropriateness of land uses, impacts on the area. And then again, the justification for the planner's professional recommendation is part of that report and then presented to council. The applicants will then present their position on it because often it can be uh, not consistent with the planners, it can be adversarial. We could be taking one position and the developers could be coming in or the applicants coming in and they're not happy with it or they might not be happy with elements of it. It could be a recommendation with variations and they might not necessarily agree with it. And then the public will be, be able to provide an opportunity to give um, their input on the recommendation as well. 
So um, that's the important part, really, is how does the Planning Advisory Committee respond? And there's a few ways. You can support the recommendation that's presented in front of you, or you could not support the recommendation. Or, as you've heard earlier, is that you could request additional information, and by all means, that's something that we certainly do. Uh, there could be um, questions on clarification on some of the reports. Um, I'm going to say, oh, as an example, we had a bumped up request for the development on, on Willow Street. There was concerns about the entrance, and, and it was bumped up, and, and certainly the Planning Advisory Committee said, we're not quite sure of the turning radius or the turning lanes into this development said we needed to come back with that information and we did developers came back with some great graphics some great presentations but I think clarified that and that's where it really works when you can defer and get that additional information and it's also important uh, to stress is that uh, it's certainly the planning advisory committee does not have to support a staff recommendation it's certainly within your power to uh, make a decision that's not consistent with staff that's Really, the difficulty, I think, and the, the toughest part is that when councillors also say that, councillors are often in a diff difficult position when they're making applications. So, when applications are being made and their recommendations coming forward on that, it's, it's a difficult thing to kind of balance. You've heard other staff say this. Um, the recommendation that is made by PAC is not the approval, the approval is made by council. So, it's a recommendation, it goes in the form of a recommendation to council. And as similarly is that council does not have to follow PAC's recommendation and you will see occasions where an application has been presented where it may have been approved at a planning advisory committee and in council it may the decision may not be supported that could be for a couple of reasons additional information um, more consideration by a counselor or it could just be in a matter of a simple matter of attendance you could have nine people at a council meeting and it votes one way. The two councillors who weren't there can come to council and could change the vote the other way. And we've seen that happen. We've seen, I've seen it certainly throughout my career of 35 years or 34 years I've been, where, I, where you have members of council who vote one way. Um, by the time it gets to another, that can happen. Council's decision, however they vote, one way or the other, it is appealable. And you've heard Jody talk about the appeal process. And then it's out of the hands of the municipality. Um, it can be appealed because of the decision, or it could be appealed because of a lack of a decision. And we've heard that earlier. Um, and the people who can appeal, it could be a member of the public, it could be the applicant, um, it could be a group, it could be a body, it could be the province, it could be the Grand River Conservation Authority who may want to decide to appeal, although that rarely happens. And with that, I'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question of a general nature. Um, you other, other, other than the committee, you didn't talk about the role of counselors too much. And um, I find uh, as a counselor, as a counselor for a while, that uh, that's one of the biggest uh, interactions I have with um, residents. Is, is because something's going on in their neighborhood. And uh, to this date, I'll, I'll give credit to the, the planning department. Um, you guys all of us have been willing to meet with me or, or some of the neighbors or whatever, and, and you've done good. Is, is, do you see a formal process to this, or do, you, do we just keep going on this road? Or, or how, you know what I mean? Have you yeah. given it much thought? Um, well, I think actually, I mean, we're, we're quite open to meeting with anybody almost any time. I mean, as you've said, we've had, I mean, we've had meetings certainly yeah. with, with residents and, and we always encourage that in spite of the process. I mean, the process is a legislative process and by its nature, it's almost intimidating to some of the members of the public. Uh, some of the, personally, I, I often refer to myself as a self-hating planner at times because if you look at some of the processes, it, it's, in, it's almost encumbering. I mean, it's almost like yeah, it's, it it's intimidating, right? Yep. Even some of the, the, the rooms are intimidating. And, and that's, unfortunately, the world we live in with the legislative process that we've got. Some, some council chambers are very intimidating. You go to Cambridge, it's like this big, great hall. You go to other ones, it seems like you're in somebody's uh, rec room. But the process is, in, is, is the process. And, and with, the, with the legal requirements that are made, because we are forced to follow the legal requirements to the letter of the law almost, it sometimes, I think, unfortunately, scares some people off. But we try to look at ways that we can try to encourage people, certainly throughout my career. And I know with Rob, you know, Rob and I have worked together 
past municipalities, we always look at trying to bring people in and trying to get dialogue and conversation. Right. Issues come up that we don't know about and we may not know about. It could be a former landfill site that we didn't know about, but residents do. So um, I'd say what we do is try to encourage conversation and discussion throughout the process at any time, and we will meet with anybody. Uh, certainly in Burford, we had applications that were going in. I went out, went out and met with 120 people at times to talk with them. So our, I think staff are available at any, any way that we can. I don't know how it can be formalized. Okay. Um, I think that other than certainly allowing and opening up uh, more communication and opportunities to talk, Okay, like you say, I mean, to date, I've been very appreciative of, of the way you guys have dealt with my requests anyway, so um, I guess we'll keep, and I'm always cognizant, because I know you guys are busy, <laughs> you know, and I don't want to waste your time, but uh, I guess we'll keep rolling the way we've been going and, until told otherwise. So. And I'd say, don't worry about, about us, I mean, we're, we are here to do yeah. that work for you and to represent and to help the public out. Certainly when I've been through and I've, and I've had applications, and I give an example of an ethanol plant that happened here about 12 or 14 years ago. Um, 350 people filled this room in the parking lot and um, people are standing up here uh, there's people that actually called me and spoke to me and when I talked to them they came and thanked me for helping them out on that there's other people who wanted to lynch me but they never talked to me so but when we get out there and actually talk to people and, and and get the opportunities to discuss it with them you start to see that you know we're here to help you out any way I can I've had um, certainly applicants who have made applications for rezonings, I've recommended refusal, and I've presented my report, and they thanked me for my reports because it's fair, yeah. you know. And and I don't get we don't get offended if people vote against or if we don't take the same position, but that's part of the process. It's part of the job. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, is, it normal, is it normal practice that if uh, in a um, when we're looking at recommendation presentations, if the, the committee says we agree to this, does it then automatically go to the next council meeting? Uh, the, they, a, a recommendation that is made or a decision that is voted on, a recommendation is voted on at a planning advisory committee, goes, is included into the minutes and the minutes go to the next council meeting for approval. At that council meeting, items can be pulled and council can say, we don't want to vote on this at this time because we think there's additional information that can come. So you have the opportunity to pull it back at a council meeting, and then it can come at the next cycle or two or three cycles down, depending on what the issue is. Okay. Member Mark. Um, I'll take that. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering, um, speaking to Councillor Miller's um, question as well around some of the processes for communication, um, We've heard some of this around some of the, the council piece, but also, um, and again, this might not, you might not be the appropriate person to ask, but um, is it possible to look at uh, what they do in, in somewhere like Hamilton where they utilize uh, OpenGov um, um, IT, uh, which is, you know, it's a product mm -hmm. um, that you, you subscribe to as a county or mm -hmm. as a municipality. Um, is it possible to do something like that? Because we do get a lot of complaints around the council table around the, how cumbersome um, individuals finding information on the web can be uh, mm -hmm. from the county. Um, is that something that might, might ameliorate some of the, the situations that Councillor Miller was talking about and that we've heard on, at the doors and uh, online? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, we've, all, we've had discussions about um, uh, more openness, right? I mean, governments tend to do this. We are making advancements in technology for sure. We're moving more into the digital world. Within the last couple of years, we've now been broadcasting council meetings and, and PAC meetings for that sole, sole purpose, and CDC meetings for that sole purpose to get out to the public more. Um, I'd say, yeah, we're, up, we're open to almost anything that we think that we can do to, to get out to the public. Um, certainly, we, we are looking internally at our processes. We had, uh, we hired pro, um, uh, a company to come in and look at our processes uh, and made some suggestions on things that we're doing. We've implemented most of them, I believe. There's a couple that are still hanging out there that are still requiring implementation, like hiring of additional staff and fee review and things like that. I'd say, yeah, if, th if there's any ideas, um, by all means, bring them to us. 
And, and I, I just yeah. want to clarify, not not just for staff for staff, staff sake, because I know this can turn into kind of a we're we're you know dumping on staff and asking all these questions, but to keep us more accountable yeah. as well, because the public has a really hard time finding our attendance records, finding our voting records, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that, because mm -hmm. they're they're buried in individual documents on individual sites. Mm -hmm. so you have to really know what you're looking for in order to get it. So so that's that's the spirit which I asked that question. So yeah. thank you so much for your presentation. <laughs> Anyone else? Then if I, I might, Mark, I got a couple comments. Um, I think we have improved somewhat because when I first got on council, it was a one-step application. Mm -hmm. And a, for a couple, like a, an application would come forward and a decision would be made that evening. And a few years back, we went to the two-step process, which uh, Mark just went through, where we receive information tonight and then staff will make a recommendation at the next <coughs> planning meeting or maybe two cycles or three cycles. Yeah. But we don't make a decision the first time we hear the application. And that was the situation a few years ago when I first got on council. So we have made some steps to improve. A couple things I want to comment on, and, and I was hoping Mark would have uh, mentioned it, but he didn't. Um, when the planner presents and then the committee has an opportunity to ask the planner questions. And then the applicant will come up and make his presentation. And the committee has an opportunity to ask the planner questions. <clears throat> Those questions may be answered, might be able to be answered that evening. They might not. Then you open the meeting up to the general public. And they come up and they'll make comment. Now some people in the general public may have a written comment which will be in your application package that evening. When the public comes up and makes a comment, you will not be allowed to ask some questions. I will make note of it, or, the, or Mr. Bell will be, will make note of those questions. <coughs> then staff, at the conclusion of all the people from the public that have come up with questions <coughs> or made comment, staff might be able to answer some of those questions, or the applicant or his agent may come back and answer some of them. But this committee will not be asking questions of the public. The public are just here to provide information. Staff and the applicant will answer those. And that's the same when it goes to step two, the night for approval. Same thing, there could be people from the public, even though staff has made a, rec let's say they've made a recommendation to approve, there still may be members of the public that will come up and comment. When they make comment, or whether it's written or verbal, that gives them the right to appeal. Mm -hmm. If they don't make comment, written or verbal, they, they lose that right to appeal. Mm -hmm. The other thing I want to comment on, uh, this committee, it's tr you don't have to follow this. It's been traditional for the last few years that the planning meeting was held on the first Tuesday of the month at 7 o'clock. But we don't have to meet then. This committee can decide when do you want to meet and at what time. I, I think you should consider, definitely consider having it at evening so that people from the public are giving a better opportunity to be here rather than an afternoon meeting. But that, that's a decision that we make at the first meeting, uh, which is tonight of when do you want to meet, what night of the week do you want to meet, and at what time. I'm recommending, of course, 7 o'clock, but you can choose another evening. And we're the first ones because there's been no a public works meeting, there's been no corporate development meeting, uh, so we get, we get the first shot. <laughs> but you want to have it early in the month so that your recommendation can go to council <clears throat> at the end of the month. You don't want to have this meeting on the fourth Monday of the month and have council on the fourth Tuesday because that doesn't give staff recommendation to put your package together which is going to go to council because you may want to change it, your vote. So folks, when do you want to meet? Because that's the next item, next meeting. John? I move that we keep it on the exactly how it is the Tuesday of the month, seven o'clock. And I'd second that because we had a good attendance this evening, and last first Tuesday is problematic for somebody, and uh, we'll fix it if it isn't broken. Well, 
Look, I don't have a problem, but I just want you to be aware, four of you are, and, and our mayor is new. You, you don't have to have it on the first Tuesday. If that's an inconvenient for you, now is the time to say, I don't like Tuesdays. Is there another night? Yeah. <laughs> so there's a recommendation on the floor to keep it on the first Tuesday of the month. I'll call the vote. Is all in favor of that? Anyone opposed? It's carried. So the next meeting will be, looks like January 8th. I'm just running a calendar through my head. Uh, first Tuesday. Oh, hold it, <laughs> Mr. Trotter. Just a point of clarification, the, because we're closed on the second, which is the first Tuesday of the month of January. Yeah. We're gonna be meeting on the 8th. That, that's what I said, January 8th, because I knew January 1st was a Tuesday. <laughs> and we won't meet on New Year's Day. So January 8th, that's the date of next meeting. And I myself will move adjournment. Do you want to be a second?